One of the most important and influential parts of an essay, particularly a persuasive or narrative essay, is the introduction. I'm not referring to how entertaining or seductive the introduction is, but how it primes the audience for what's to come. It's supposed to set the general tone and foreshadows ideas that will be expanded upon later. Kidology is a phenomenal essayist. For all the comments I see about her videos being word salad, her channel frequently yields videos with well-constructed theses, and every section adds on to and supports those initial statements. Recognizing a video essay as good or well-constructed is not an omission of agreeance, however. It is simply a recognition of ability. And when I know a creator has this ability and is not just creating extended versions of casual commentary videos, I begin to be more critical of every sentence constructed, every piece of evidence exemplified, and every inflection on every word. To open a video with what was supposed to be a good faith critique with a comparison to the left, to the fashion icon Napoleon of Animal Farm. The left are heading toward Napoleon territory, and by that I don't mean toward territory of Napoleon Bonaparte, the Emperor of France. I mean Comrade Napoleon, the Berkshire boar from Orwell's Animal Farm. To then release a follow-up video that opens with a juxtaposition between Professor Ibram X. Kendi, a renowned but highly questionable researcher and academic, to FD signifier a leftist with an asterisk, video essays, these comparisons definitely set a tone. Not a tone that many who, I would probably argue, are a little too emotionally invested in creators and slash or online politics would receive as neutral or charitable. Not a tone that I would describe as impartial or impassioned enough to truly persuade those who are not already predisposed to agreeing with you, but definitely a tone. <laughs> Recently, he signed a contract with ESPN, yes, ESPN, the sports network, and is a presenter on a series about tackling racism in sports. He was also gifted 625,000 US dollars from the MacArthur Foundation in 2021, and he also charges 20,000 US dollars for any speaking appearance. Now, where have I heard somebody else trying to charge 20,000 US dollars for a speaking appearance before so destiny i know you're watching this i will come on your stream after you donate 25k to community movement builders here in atlanta to address the stop cop city movement if you drop 25k i will come on your stream and we can have the most banal argument ah oh, there it is <laughs> I would imagine you would either laugh at the hyperbolific comparisons or be made hopelessly critical if you are a leftist or are left-leaning. In Orwell's Animal Farm, Napoleon, from the beginning, sought to not set the animals free of Mr. Jones, their previous owner and slaver, but to become the new Mr. Jones. Napoleon, from the beginning, utilized the animals' optimism, ignorance, and desires for positive change to manipulate and corner them, then slowly but surely push them into his fascist regime. I keep saying from the beginning because shortly after the animals' liberation, while Comrade Snowball was hard at work attempting to teach the older animals how to read and write as he had learned, Napoleon kidnapped puppies and raised them away from the others, only for those puppies to later reappear as brainwashed and muscle-bound with the sole purpose of killing at Napoleon's command. Beginning with Major's fervent, enraged speech on humanity's evil and the animal's need for solidarity, Napoleon saw an opportunity. An opportunity to not save, but to exploit for his own self-interest. To compare the left to a tyrannical dictator who sold out the lives, souls, and happiness of the animals he claimed to serve, and then to turn around and give praise to the old left while showcasing a diverse set of movements, was definitely a choice. <laughs> If you have read or remembered Animal Farm, then effectively, you would be able to piece together in less than three minutes how ill Kidology thinks of what she refers to as the new left and what I refer to as the online left. Despite her frequent caveating that her analysis is purely analytical without placing value judgments. For a leftist, I can imagine this to be very grating. For me, I am now expecting evidence of the tyranny of the left wing from the video Kindly Do Better. I'm expecting examples of fascism that do not only affect it in 
individual, but a country, a society, or at the very least, the development of a strong pattern that could possibly lead to this outcome. The opening of why Bright Tube is so stale has me anticipating the outlining of both Kendi and FD signifiers' propensities to capitalize via grifting on anti-racism theory. If you are unaware of who Kendi is and you have watched Kidology's initial leftist critique video, her summation is largely correct in my opinion given the information available at the time. Kendi headed two anti-racist centers. One was at the American University, which he later left due to dissatisfaction, and upon his departure he took the research already compiled, as well as the name, to a new institution. Boston University. At BU's Center of Anti-Racist Research, or CAR, Kendi and his staff to this date have not only produced no substantial results in the two years the facility has been open, but the center recently underwent an inquiry of financial mismanagement due to a recent round of layoffs as well as former employee outcries despite the facility's successful funding history. Presently, this inquiry has been completed with no findings of the alleged financial mismanagement, though an investigation of the center's grants remains outstanding standing to ensure proper reporting procedures were followed. Through all scrutiny, Kendi has maintained the restructuring did not come from financial distress brought on by my financial mismanagement. However, nothing has been said on either Kendi or Boston University's part to contradict the lack of tangible goals, deadlines, and results of the center. In fact, an external agency has been brought on to advise on the center's future. Through all scrutiny, Kendi's career as an avant-garde in pop culture anti-racism research has continued to flourish. The price tag of his his presence speaks to that. And he also charges 20,000 US dollars for any speaking appearance. What I can glean from Kidology's introduction and from my own research is that one, either Kendi asserts his celebrity first and his desire for change second, making him the sellout Kidology proclaimed him to be, or two, Kendi is inadequate in leading a research center due to much of his interest lying in postulations, writing, and speaking, and both universities may have severely missed up by selecting a highly recognizable face to lead this endeavor rather than someone who has a proven track record of results and willingness to not only speak, but act. What you determine here is up to you, dear viewer, but this tangent exists in my introduction for two reasons. To show you the brevity of what Kidology is equating FD signifier to, and to also make you look at what Kendi has produced for a future point. These are Kendi's books. This is one of the only tangible results of CAR, which is a collaborative COVID data tracking website that is no longer updated. These are CAR's initiatives for 2023. There is a particular commonality amongst all of these examples, think on it, and we'll wrap back around to it later. For now, what we have here is a video essayist that initiated what she claimed to be a good faith critique with a comparison to fascism and a comparison to a professor who, at best, is too incompetent to truly lead and at worst is a sellout to another essayist who sold a charitable donation to a cause he believed in in exchange for debating a streamer that he otherwise had no incentive of interacting with. And all of these critiques are coming from a person who claims to have no investment in politics and has no care to the concept of selling out. Kendi has proved himself to be a sellout. I don't care too much about selling out because my apolitics, or politics depending on what you want to call it, really encourages me to see every individual for the individual that they are and is ultimately all about the individual. Sounds like my type of video. Hypocrisy is one of the most favorite critiques and gripes of the online left. It's quite easy to build arguments of hypocrisy existing in any creator or influencer, but online leftists do make it exceptionally easier. Well, hello there. Before we continue with the kerfuckle that is BreadTube, I want to take a moment and thank today's video sponsor, Aura. Have you ever Googled your name and been disturbed by the personal details that pop up? Well, I recently did, and the results showcase my entire history since I've come of age. When I tried to get my information removed from one of the websites, they demanded that I email them and even pay a fee to ensure my details never reappeared on their site. It's absolutely insane that I never consented to having my personal information spread all over the internet, but I have to jump through hoops and pay the very people profiting from my data 
just to protect my privacy. Despite my best efforts to be careful about my online footprint, it's clear that it'll never be enough unless I have a service like Aura helping to protect my details. That's why I've been using Aura. With just a couple of pieces of information that most people give out freely, like their first and last names, anyone can access your entire history online. As a mother, this does not just frustrate me, it terrifies me. But that's where Aura comes in. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests on my behalf. It's an all-in-one solution that provides everything from antivirus protection and a VPN to keep my data safe online to identify theft insurance and credit monitoring. Now what you can do, dear viewer, is go to aura.com slash unpoetic justice to start your two week free trial. Go ahead and click the link in my description box below. Don't let others exploit and profit off of your private information any longer. Take control with Aura. Now back to the bullshit. Many have taken to holding the left to morally high standards, unattainable standards. For instance, if a leftist stoops to personal attacks, then the critique would be pulling on the perceived kindness people think the left supposedly touts. While I have never believed that the left preaches kindness, I do believe principles of compassion, of awareness, of introspection are all embedded within the leftist political philosophy. Creating a more holistic, proportionally represented society that encourages not only equal but equitable treatment, it's typically a core tenet within social progressivism, although the pathways to achieving such a feat may vary. Nevertheless, this goal requires a leftist as an individual to constantly challenge and reform one's own thinking and social position. In her Bread to Critique, the acknowledgement of hypocritical practices is the fundamental basis of the video. Whether the point being focused on the addition of tagalongs into the Bread Tube space, intolerance of different perspectives, performative anti-capitalism, or the astounding of luxury beliefs. BreadTube, otherwise dubbed as LeftTube, is a loose informal group of online creators who create video content including video essays and live streams from either socialist, social democratic, communist, anarchist, or other left-wing perspectives. This is a descriptor kindly given by Wikipedia, however, I would expand on it and state that it is an algorithmic suggestion and push towards certain kinds of content based on the audience's preferences. Meaning, the audience inadvertently decides what BreadTube truly is. Creators do not become lumped together simply because creators mirror the content styles and talking points of others, but because the audience themselves see those commonalities and gravitate accordingly. No matter how the space was created or mapped out though, the overall goal of these works was and is to create edutainment or intercation, since I believe the entertainment value typically comes first and foremost. Education is often thought to be a concept that is foundationally formal and led by experts, but in actuality, it can and should come in many forms from a diverse set of mouths. Education, to me, is simply learning about something that can serve as some use to you. An enlightening experience, if you will, as the second definition on Google states. If that means learning about the lived experience of another, critically overanalyzing media through the eyes of another, watching a nitpick of vapid TikTok trends and how they expose wayward cultural and societal values, consider your extracurriculars checked off for the semester at YouTube University. Just know that there are indeed objective and subjective evaluations evaluations of one type of education versus another. One of Kidology's primary critiques on BreadTubers is a disconnect between their spoken political ideals and their everyday lives, especially when it comes to anti-capitalism rhetoric. What is becoming increasingly apparent is that whilst BreadTubers criticize capitalism and even brand themselves as anti-capitalist, they are disproportionately benefiting from it. She expands on this topic throughout her essay, utilizing Zoe Unlimited, Alice Capel, and Mina Lee as paramount examples. Zoe Unlimited, who has been dubbed a tagalong by Kidology, is used to showcase those who shift their content from apolitical to having a left-leaning or socially progressive spin right when the algorithm began to show a bit of favor to that type of content style. Zoe has a history in social media marketing and by her own admission knows what sells. The evolution of her content is a perfect example of how influential these ideas are when it comes to not real world change, but to career advancement. Zoe Unlimited is effectively an example of someone who's self to capitalize on a growing niche genre. Or is she? Kind of. 
but not really. I would define Zoe's content as consistently apolitical with flex of what could be considered tenets of leftism, but based on her content style, her topics, and the general flow of her channel, I would say that her perspectives are informed by her own experiences with mild observations of popular TikToks. She knows just how much she can ride the line. Her content does show a pattern, if I'm being generous, of self-actualization and endeavors of financial security. She critiques not capitalism, but overconsumption. When culture steers too strongly towards one direction, the aftermath is usually that it reverses toward the other side of the extreme in a much heavier dosage than before. She critiques not being woke, but woke washing done at the expense of disingenuity and separation. She critiques not wanting to glow up, but wanting to glow up for the wrong reasons. Redefining glow up. Beyond changing what only the eyes can perceive, glowing up needs to be an internal process to be sustainable. Insecurities don't go away from a lash extension, the hottest new shoes, or the three hour long nail session. They weaken when you reset your mindset about yourself. She sticks to safe opinions that have just the tiniest bit of spice to them to make them stand out slightly from other channels of similar content styles that are more resolute leftists, like say Anna Marie Forcino. Kidology cops to Zoe not truly being a bread tuber, but someone who capitalizes on that ambiguous space. I don't consider Zoe a true diehard bread tuber, but her audience's growing recognition of the message not aligning to the person's own actions and life is an endemic issue of bread tube now. But I still disagree. Zoe is an influencer by trade and does just enough to satiate what I'm assuming to be a largely progressive audience while leaning into the aesthetics she loves. She simply rejects extremes. Videos such as, you're not ugly, you're just poor, all rely on arguments that are characteristically bread tube. I don't know if that's a fair representation of a left-leaning creator. Leftists, by the very nature of their political desires, are radical and frankly, demand radical change. Zoe resides in and appears to have adopted a culture that is certainly more progressive than her homeland of China, and it would be expected that her content showcases these more progressive outlooks. Being progressive in nature does not necessarily make one a leftist or even a progressive. Kidology and I are both primary examples of this. I can't believe that one of my most radical takes in this entire video will be that Kidology is not conservative because I know where your minds are going and we'll get there in due time. Just know that there's a difference between someone being pejoratively conservative and someone just not being as left-leaning as you are. BreadTube is a genre that is supposed to be fairly more complex, depending on who you're speaking to, thorough, and less palatable to an average Joe that is not chronically online or highly invested in academia with its sweeping dissections of systemic issues and varied political philosophies. Zoe's content, on the other hand, is surface level. TikTok adjacent and palatable, marketable. She is seeking not to change the status quo or change minds. She simply states her opinion, collects her bag, and moves along. That said, I believe that statement would beg the question, do Brett tubers genuinely seek to induce radical change? Generally, how I separate a leftist from someone who is simply more progressive in mindset or someone who is a liberal is by their economic standings. If you are not a socialist, a communist, an anarchist, or not fully opposed to capitalism, then I probably would not consider you a leftist. However, Many within the online left seem to utilize more of an ethos model to examine someone's political standings. What side or ideological community does an individual critique more? What media do they consume? Which views do they think fall outside of the bounds of reasonable debate? What slogans do they use? Or perhaps even better, what slogans do they criticize? This leads to the identification of creators who do not necessarily produce politically driven content to being labeled as left-leaning or as a leftist. However, just because the audience politicizes the 
content doesn't mean the creator had any intention of producing it from that lens. This ethos model leads creators like Mina Lee being dubbed under this political faction, though she has a clear vested interest in both capitalism and individualism given her love of vintage fashion. The fashion frequently showcased on Mina Lee's channel are not created for simple functional use. They are fashion pieces. They are articles of clothing that symbolize one's social standing, one's assimilation or dissimilation. They are statement pieces that distinguish the individual via, notably, historically classes distinctions. It could be my lack of exposure to Mina Lee's content, but from what I have seen, meaning her most recent videos and some that were shown in Kidology's video, I would not label her a leftist, but I would probably call her left-leading. And I'm wondering if that too is a mistake. Not a mistake in that I'm questioning if her content is sufficient to be labeled as left-leaning, but because I'm starting to wonder if it's productive to insist upon a creator's political label when their content does not truly speak to it. For now though, we'll move forward with the assumption that Mina Lee is a left-leaning creator since she is often lumped in with BreadTube and her content does considerably suggest it. The contradictory nature of online leftists is none too surprising to me because I find it to be a fundamental human trait. Kidology's examples of Mina Lee and Alice Capel were the strongest representation of this type of contradiction. Not because of the capitalistic nature of both channels, we'll get into that later, but because both creators appear to have strong values. For Alice Capel, from the framing of Kidology's video, she advocates against hustle culture, but advertises for Squarespace. Imagine how much money anti-capitalist video essayist Elise Capel is making from her year-long sponsorship deal with Squarespace. Good for her, truly. But also, you're not an anti-capitalist. In a video about how parasitic capitalists are, Elise said the following. And to be fair, only a few career paths can allow for that to happen, and they are not known for being the most ethical. The goal isn't to work hard, but to work smart. And by smart, they mean making the most profit with the least amount of effort. For example, working smart means dropshipping, it means creating and monetizing content, content about finance and how to get rich. It means selling books and courses or creating hustler universities. Interestingly, the video is sponsored by Squarespace, a website that encourages entrepreneurship, hustle culture, and creating forms of passive income. Mina Lee, who is well aware of the many ethical failings of both luxury and fast fashion, has signed on to a modeling agency that appears to have no care in challenging these long accepted and damaging industry practices. I think that even though, you know, like everyone wants to say that this model doesn't have to be white, and obviously we are seeing a lot more racial diversity than in years past, um, it is a gradual progression. There's still a lot more white models in the industry, and much of the beauty standard is still based on like white Eurocentrism. Beyond just the fact that it's harder for models of color to get well-paying jobs or just to get jobs at all, there is something more dangerous at play on like a widespread um, scale. For instance, in 2004, Harvard psychiatrist and anthropologist Ann Becker conducted a study and found that three years after the introduction of television into Fiji in 1995, 11.9% of adolescent girls suffered eating disorders while trying to change their Fijian build into one that resembled the Western images they were exposed to via their television sets. Mina Lee signed with IMG Models, an international modeling agency that has signed such names as Gigi Hadid, Bella Hadid, Cara Delevingne, Kendall Jenner, Lily Cole, Hailey Bieber, and Maddie Ziegler. This is different from the overarching critique of participating in capitalism, because these are actions that were unequivocally within their control. These specific actions came down to an individualized choice that many everyday people are not faced with on such a scale. Career growth, not stability, growth versus your ethical or moral principles. Both creators could have realistically rejected these opportunities. This is not the same as an average leftist viewer accepting a position as a cashier at a retailer who knowingly exploits overseas factories. There is rarely any privilege in obtaining a traditional job to sustain yourself. But Mina Lee and Alice Capel were both already well-established, well-respected full-time creators presumably before these opportunities presented themselves. In other words, they had the privilege of a true choice. Do they opportunistically support the very businesses they both indirectly and directly critique? Or 
do they seek out opportunities with companies that are more so aligned with their individual values, even though that would have feasibly meant less money, less exposure? Many would have the gut reaction to say that these creators must support themselves, and that's true. But at what cost? When should the line be drawn between principles and opportunistic growth? When you assert your individual prosperity after you have already achieved individualized stability above the tenets you preach to others, tenets that are notably meant to serve others, you have shown your hand as not only an individualist, but indeed as a hypocrite. However, however, because online leftism sways more into political philosophy, the study of the fundamental nature and knowledge of existence, rather than political theory, which provides a more materialistic outlook and approach, this hypocrisy seems more pronounced than what it truly is. Traditionally, political theory is a camp that the streamer portion of Bread to You normally leans into more than the video essayist portion. When personally interacting with someone, we don't tend to sketch out and map every point of contention within the person's words versus their actions. That's only done when a great deviation or divestment presents itself. Like when a Christian preaches of the love and acceptance of God while screaming about the incivility of homosexuality or a teacher refusing to teach. To children be allowed to transition, to medically transition. To and, medically and transition. Do you understand what medically transition? Yes. yes, yes. To medically transition, um, I think in the current climate and with current lack of knowledge, especially medical knowledge about a consensual medical knowledge, I don't think so, no. I think that once you're an adult, you can do whatever you want, but I think as a child, not medically, no. I think there are extenuating circumstances. I don't think it's a universal thing. Medical professionals, I have to leave it up to them because I, like you, to be perfectly honest, don't actually know everything, especially not about individual cases. Uh, I don't think this is a political thing. It's a very individual and personal thing. Um, and I don't think that my opinion on it should implicate that uh, or should come before that. I am not interested in debating the nature of trans phobia and the rights and uh, needs of trans people um, and, um, and, uh, for content. I'm just not. Um, so, so I want to be clear, like the, the reason why I don't want to go further is a matter of not wanting to participate in the debate of the existence and humanity of people I call peers and friends. You're not going to get anywhere politically and insofar as people understanding trans people, actual trans people, if it's just, I'm not going to talk about this because I'll be called a transphobe okay. by my community so and cancelled, etc. It's not about worrying about accountability to my community. It's being accountable to my community. Parasocially, we are far more predisposed to creating patterns of hypocrisy within the content we're consuming. Independently, we genuinely do ignore the several contradictions in our own behaviors as well as the people around us. I suspect it's because a physical person inadvertently gives you a more holistic perspective of them, even if you don't like them. Online, however, people are only catalogs of information. You can easily scroll through anyone's channel and find two or three contradictory themes, messages, or statements. The problem with individualism is not that the individual is granted freedom over oneself or values independence, even hyper-independence. The true problem with individualism as it manifests itself in the West is that on a large scale, it often comes at the expense of damning others in pursuit of that false self-reliance and fragile self-actualization. Individualism frequently begins and ends with the individual. My apolitics, or politics, depending on what you want to call it, really encourages me to see every individual for the individual that they are and is ultimately all about the individual. There's rarely a care given to understanding the ideas of another unless there is a personal gain to be had. Politically and economically, this poses an issue. If one's sole and only approach to political issues is themselves, how can we expect this to yield substantial results for the betterment of a nation or country? On a governing and institutional level, how can we expect the marginalized to become not the marginalized when the concept of the idealized individual is so heavily pushed to the point where everything and every failure is seen as only an individual concern? The answer is 
you cannot. The United States systems and countries who conduct themselves similarly rely upon the majority of individuals being similar enough for shit to remain copacetic. They rely on the majority group, the white working class, to feed into this lie of hyper-individuality enough to where they don't notice the very same systems harming them or the very same systems politicized marginalized people groups are voicing concern over. American individualism sublimably pushes the idea of the white working class's greatest enemy being namely racial minority groups. It points the finger to immigrants for the reason as to why the job market is limited. It points to the black baby mama on welfare fair for the reason as to why taxes are so high. Per American individualism, these people groups are made up of individual failures. And that's why the working class is suffering. Not because of inflation caused by blundered economic decisions by the federal government. Not because they were never truly set up for long-term success systematically. Not because they've been abandoned in favor of the very wealthy. Oh no, oh no, no, no. It's the color folk that are the problem. Ironically enough, Though Gen Z and Millennials often feed into leftism in an attempt to resolve these sorts of issues, they are the most hyper-individualistic generations I have ever encountered. But not the kind of individualism I see in Gen X or Boomers. The individualism of the youth is a type that refuses personal responsibility of any kind because of their understanding of a failing system. It is a type that fosters all of the pressure of collectiveness, but practices none of the care. I've yet to be convinced that there is true unity and cohesion amongst distinct identity groups even across intersectionality. In Animal Farm, Napoleon, Snowball, and the rest of the animals were originally radicalized by Major who determined the humans to all be evil. We will never get our rightful share from Farmer Jones. Overthrow this evil tyrant and we shall be rich and free. This made sense within the confines of their then extreme circumstances. There's often little to no room for nuance or minority outliers in times of intense strife. Major, speaking from his own observations, cast the humans as slavers and the animals as their victims, but as comrades to one another. This blatant separatism can create a deep bond of unity, especially amongst the downtrodden. However, the very separation that saved the animals by emboldening them to radicalize and carry out a mutiny of sorts was also their downfall. When you embed principles of separation within your ideology, you shouldn't expect for it to stop at the once overt enemy. Outside of Animal Farm, if history has taught us one thing, it's that there is always an enemy. Even when it cannot be corporealized in the shape of another singular human being, we are all very aware of the multiple fictitious enemies the right creates, from trans people to modern women. To them, these conceptual people pose a threat to their traditionalist tried and true measures. The left isn't free from this very same president. The enemy of the left, however, depends. There was a time I would have thought that the enemy of the left was the current state of systems. Systems that have bred implicit biases and embedded prejudice into the very culture that surrounds them in order to retain their strength and keep them going. With these sudden shifts and schisms within the online left, I'm not so sure anymore. Sometimes it seems the enemy is anyone who does not operate within the same limited playing fields as they do. We are to believe the left's theories of cause and their postulations of change, and if we do not, we can't play with them. Sometimes it seems that the enemy is anyone who chooses not to speak in the same way as them, or someone who does not use the same buzzwords or the same qualifiers. The enemy seems to be anyone who refuses to radicalize, anyone who refuses to not be content with good enough. Good enough just often means understanding that people will always be hateful, always be prejudiced, but as long as that shit is mitigated enough and is not systematically propagated, we can be good. It seems to me that the plot is often lost by the online left because the new recruits always have to pick a fight with a person they think embodies these systemic issues. Kidology spoke to her concerns of New Age leftists' perceived propensity to cut off those closest to them for the sake of their politics. A lot of surveys that I've read show that young people now, for instance, uh, in the UK and the US, are well, especially progressives and more liberal people, uh, specifically white liberals and white progressives, um, are far more likely than any other demographic to completely sever ties with friends and family because of 
a difference in opinion about uh, some sort of very topical cultural political and social issue. I believe this comes from the idea of the personal becoming political, as second wave feminists would have said, or as more commonly heard now, all things are inherently political. Not to be an ass, but choosing the word inherently to me screams either political nihilism, in which case, hi, welcome to my club, or more likely, a myopic outlook on the scope of politics inherently would suggest an innate or permanent state of being. Using racial issues as an example, if race is inherently political, that would mean political discussions will always continue to experience some type of disparity or hold some type of emphasis on race. And is it the goal not to do that? Eventually, if your perception is that race is and always will be married to political discussions, then you are indicating you do not believe equality or equity will ever be achieved, not even in your own imagination. That is actually my belief, because unlike Kidology, who has faith in humanity, I have none. All we have is faith and hope, and I have faith and hope in humanity, and that includes people on the left. I see no inherent goodness in people, only inherent neutrality, that will eventually be molded into something far more complex and uncertain by a mixture of both nature and nurture. However, for a leftist, nihilism typically isn't your go-to, because leftism in and of itself is highly optimistic, and in part, relies upon humanity's desire to do better. So. Instead, I am resigned to believe that this phrase out of the mouths of leftists is symptomatic of the left's lack of imagination and foresight. There is no tangible end goal or plan of how to get there. In this case, it'd be a lack of direction on how to take steps towards an anti-racist society where race can be acknowledged and only used as an apolitical classification that is irrespective to the group's experience. Let's take F.D. Signifier for instance, a wonderful essayist and self-proclaimed leftist with an asterisk who desires to talk about the things he cares about in an intercation fashion. Those things largely being black issues, black criminality myth, and several other structural issues that heavily pertain to Black Americans. In a video that Kidology referenced in her introduction of her breadtube analysis on his secondary channel, FD is impassioned when it comes to defining and helping people understand how systemic issues affect Black people, and explaining the differences in his approaches when it comes to large-scale topical discussion versus his past one-on-ones with his Black students. Racism is a problem, and Black people have to also work amongst themselves. This is not, this is not this, this is not like some type of deep truth. We know this shit. When I worked with black children in black schools that were underserved, and I had black parents coming through my office um, who were uh, alcoholics, who were uh, in the system, whose kids were being systematized because of their addiction issues or because of their behavior. When I was in courts and talking to black children who had gotten caught up on charges because dump charges, gun charges, theft charges, assault charges. I didn't sit down with these little boys and say, yo, you know, the real problem is white supremacy. I didn't do that shit because that's fucking stupid. However, when it comes to solutions, we get this. I, t I tell y'all the solutions all the time. Niggas know the solution. I can, of course, infer what he means because he already said it earlier in the video. There is no way to solve black people's problems in America without massive social and economic change. There's no way to do it. If black people do not organize and resist and engage uh, and find ways to seize the levers of power politically and economically in this country, if we cannot mobilize, all of Black people will never change. But I'm not talking about intangible, conceptual solutions. I could actually care left if leftists don't have the big answer. I'm not even looking for steps an individual can take in this case. What I want is for him to tell us about specific changes that he believes are feasible and presently actionable in order to take steps towards his idealized version of society. Most online leftists cannot or do not do this because, like Kidology said, 
they often lack expertise or extensive knowledge of the systems they are critiquing. The left is lazy insofar as getting very comfortable in its own self-righteousness and in its own bubble of information. Well-versed in explaining things in a zoomed out lens. Yes, but the fatigue people are seeing grow online, some have called it the second wave of anti-woke or anti-SJW, comes from the lack of specifics, lack of direction, and lack of catharsis. When you narrow in and give particulars about what you think is actionable, it gives your audience some level of reassurance. Leftist video essayists, or the left's new thought leaders as Kidology ungraciously proclaims, they're not inept. That is, they have the ability to really learn and get down to the nitty gritty without only constantly dealing in conceptual structures, but they don't. Pragmatically approaching structural disparities with the intent to rectify them requires a well-equipped understanding of those structures, how they truly manifest, and imagination. And weirdly enough, Given the past formidable, complex, and impactful ideas the left has historically gifted to society, the online left lacks this imagination. The online leftists can't even seem to imagine an America, a Canada, a United Kingdom, or whatever Western country where these systemic issues are lessened. I think this comes from two primary sources. I'm gonna say it again, a lack of detailed knowledge. And two, an illusion of power. But no matter the cause, when you are unable to provide even the barest bones prescription, people become lost, paranoid, and not nihilistic as many of you would negatively assume, but hopeless. Hopelessness paired with paranoia leads to people saying and doing questionable things, radical things, like referring to a war as based, hearkening to an example Kidology provided. BreadTube video essayists Second Thought, Hakim, and Yogopnik call the brutality that happened to Israeli civilians and children earlier this month based, describing them, that is, fathers, mothers, and children as colonizers. Tell us, Hakim, you're the closest. Mm. Tell us what the fuck is going on. Very base things. But TLDR for before, like, you know, to preempt all the questions, this has two two major benefits. Number one, it's kind of to throw a wrench in the normalization process be between Israel and Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. um, which is a very good thing. Uh, and number two is also to um, gain concessions in the forms of prisoner swaps. Um, because there's a lot of people who are imprisoned illegally um, within by, by Israeli, by the Zionist forces. Um, and uh, all these people that uh, the, the, the armed groups within Palestine have managed to capture, uh, these people will be eventually sent back to to um, to Israel in return for freeing at least some some number. Um, and just to give you a perspective on how valuable a single prisoner is, the last time there was a prisoner exchange, um, they exchanged one Israeli prisoner for like a thousand twenty seven. Palestinian prisoners, yeah. I believe, something like that. Mm -hmm. So if you've got now, what, 50 to bargain with, that's yeah. huge. It actually takes civilian hostage, or is that fake news? Um, I don't care. Yeah, the <laughs> occupiers I don't, are I not do, uh, civilians. That, that is what it comes yeah. down to. Like, if imagine, French, yeah. like, if, if Sorry, uh, Germany, you know, let's say Germany, to, mm -hmm. to be non-controversial, invaded the United States, and they, they said, you know what, Cincinnati, Ohio is our ancestral home. And, you know, everyone knows mm. that's blatantly false. But they... they take your home, they murder your grandma, they bulldoze like your neighbor's house. Are those people mm. civilians there? No, they're occupiers. And those those are criminals. Yeah. That, that is, there are no mm. civilians there in the illegal military occupation. Or encouraging your subscribers to do something illegal. I suggest people look up war tax resistance. They can teach you how to legally or illegally um, avoid taxes because we know our tax dollars have been funding some of the most atrocious things um, across the world. If it isn't obvious, do not do this shit. I guarantee you will sooner destroy any financial health you may have or could have had than teach the federal government a lesson. The United States Treasury Department is far more likely to garnish the wages of individual citizens than multi-million dollar companies because we are more accessible. If you feel like things are that dire while you watch YouTube videos on your phone with unlimited data or Wi-Fi, or on your laptop or TV that is worth at least hundreds of dollars as you 
drag yourself to a job that while you are more than likely unhappy, depressed, or demoralized in, you are physically safe and unharmed. As you enjoy the many Western comforts around you that are classified as pure luxury in countries that only have a fraction of our economic wealth, please understand that the world is indeed coming to an end for those overseas that are yet again undergoing some of the worst atrocities I hope you never have to see. But using it as a justification to financially destroy yourself for some type of short-lived or instant gratification to an ambiguous cause or protest is something that I would heavily and strongly advise against. This is why all things cannot be political. People will always need to have a space where they can dress down, take off their SJW attire, and commit the selfish act of loving their father who may have some unresolved racial issues, or laughing with the ladies at their jobs who more than likely voted for Trump at least once. You will find yourself in constant verbal wars, in constant discontent, if you continue to walk with this idea that you must fight with every single person who does not adhere to your ideology. An ideology that is largely founded in immaterial, complex academic evaluations. It will be the left's demise if the foot does not come off the necks of the undoctrinated individuals. Individuals do simultaneously uphold structural issues while not being the causes or the end all to changing them. When we discuss individuals approximations to systemic issues in reference to their identities, we should do so with cultural relativism in mind. American leftists cannot simply attack capitalistic structures through individuals. They must attack the very core of particularly American culture. American culture has been debated upon and mocked over the decades. There are obvious distinctions between Americans and other Westerners, like our food or our way of speaking, but where we tend to differ as Americans when compared against other Westerners is that there is something rather hollow about American culture. There's nothing that really and truly binds us together like many other cultures do. American culture, at its core, it's capitalistic. From young ages, we are taught to capitalize on abilities or traits that we have that, at the time, probably saw as innocuous fun. The little artist in the classroom was told that she could make a career out of it if she hones her skills and perhaps goes into marketing design. The popular boy who ran the fastest at recess was told that he can make a career out of it if he keeps up with it and trains endlessly. Nothing is just for fun in the United States not even when you're a child. Everything you do, everything you love, everything you are marginally better at than other people are all potential means to an end. There's no such thing as intrinsic worth. All things must always be externally validated. This is why we are insatiable, why our value systems contradict or seem non-existent. At our core, we want to exist for more but cannot. Many of us have come to realize that it's almost meaningless to have standards for ourselves because life in American society acts to stay in our hands before we can even make the choice to be better. And thus, we never get better or try to reform the system in any meaningful way. Leftists do not even somewhat get to the core of that cultural distinction because in order to do so without alienating your audience, you have to provide an out. That's where we see all the buts or the, mm, uh, well, maybes when it comes to topics like overconsumption within the fashion and beauty industries or opposingly, you have to be an example of what it could look like to move against that culture. You have to actually challenge the status quo. I believe I am, once again, now begging the biggest question of Kidology's critique. Does BreadTube really aim to challenge the status quo? In practice, all leftist creators are mini capitalists. <laughs> In order to profit from and support yourself off of content creation, you must make the decision to engage with capitalism on a level that the average person does not. Channel marketing, virality, view counts, brand deals, these are all aspects tied to capitalism. You must thoroughly market your product. In this case, it would be the creators themselves alongside their political philosophies. To continue to profit from the structure, you have to stay on brand. So Tara, for example, trying to escape her label wasn't on brand. My dream is to no longer be associated with the term bread tube. Really? I hate the term. Really? Yeah, it's just so, one, 
it's not I feel like it's not really about politics per se it's about who you're associated with because we've talked about this before mm -hmm. there are people who make way more explicitly political content than I do but aren't considered bread tubers and I think it's like an elitism thing mm -hmm. and secondly it's just so much pressure I can imagine how suffocating it may feel to be looked at as a thought leader as someone of high moral and ethical standing the burden of building a platform that is supposed to critique the social and governing structures around you would be people hearing your message as only and solely either systemic or individual responsibility when you're probably more so meaning it as a philosophical evaluation that's why specific solutions are rarely given amongst other disagreements this is where kidology and I really diverge kidology approaches less to you like this. Are we actually forced to partake in capitalism to survive as a need? And this is categorically false based on the same logic that these creators use. Because whilst they demand radical change from everybody else, they are proving themselves unwilling to lead by radical example. Whereas I approach it with the assumptions that they are idealists who frequently remove all blame from the individual and place it onto X, Y, or Z system. When you push the barest responsibility back onto leftist audience. Whether that's saying something like, hey, maybe don't buy from a shitty brand that sells poor quality clothing that not only destroys the world's environment rapidly, but the lives of the employees they abuse. There is often so much anger, so many excuses. Kidology's perspective of leftovers is uncharitable, but I think she means it as a way to harshly ground certain bread tubers. Most bread tubers cannot live up to their extravagant ideals and most do not believe working within the system is the way to cause true change. That is something that is very much exemplified in FD Signifier's Fuck the Police video. In this political piece, he spoke of the misunderstandings of the legality surrounding the police and the frequent conservative co-opting of common leftist or left-leaning phrases like defund the police or abolish the police. In 2020, the concept of defunding the police was at its most popular level ever in gaining steam. And then the concept of defunding the police turned into reforming the police, which literally turned into funding the police and resulted in increases in police budgets nationwide since 2020. It was a radical concept that was co-opted. Outlining the systematically driven persistent failings of the police in the United States communicates to his audience that this arrangement can never be corrected and can never work. Call it what it is. It's not reform the police, it's not defund the police, it's not abolish the police. It's fuck the police coming straight from the Kidology disregards Fab Socialism's disclaimer because she thinks there is a way to live as a socialist outside of present day capitalism. The business of being anti capitalism is only growing in value, and nothing gives the venture more ethical credibility than bread tubes moral arbiters who partake in the very business model and profit making activities that they demonize others for. It is not hypocritical to critique capitalism while partaking in it, reads a disclaimer on Fab Socialism's YouTube channel. In fact, we are critiquing capitalism largely because we are forced to partake in it in order to survive. But is this declaration actually true? Are we actually forced to partake in capitalism to survive as a need? This is categorically false based on the same logic that these creators use. And to that I say, be fucking for real. <laughs> Although Fab Socialism is probably one of the only left two creators I can think of who encourages financial transparency and seems to intentionally cap her own income to align with her socialist values. So I am going to start making videos very soon, indefinitely. I'm going to be transitioning to any type of like minimum wage type of work because making videos is minimum wage work, but I want to do something that can be a little more physical. I imagine myself like cleaning up the carts in front of a store or something, maybe even a receptionist. I don't want to do anything that's like fully remote. I want to do something I go to and just when I get off, I can use my brain for all the things that I'm going to be talking about today. 
So to keep creating interesting for the time being, I'm requesting certain types of comments um, on this video and only those will be allowed for people to see. So please comment your salary or hourly wage and how many hours you work so people can get an idea of what other people are making. Um, please comment what you're struggling with financially, mentally, physically. Please comment how you have been boycotting, building mutual aid, things of that sort. I want this comment section to give people a sense of where people are and to connect. Feel free to comment back to people and those will be approved as well. She would be unable to do so had it not been for the privilege she stumbled upon with the creation of her platform. The fact that good criticism is still so hard to come by and manage online in regards to the online left is also disappointing. I've found that some of the most powerful videos are usually on apps where people can uh, turn out videos quicker and longer like TikTok. Um, but across any platform, usually the creators or people who make videos who are the most impactful have not built up platforms for years. And a lot of the social media actions that have really challenged the status quo have not been from people building their platforms for years. Like if your livelihood is from morally posturing and theorizing online all day, you have a great responsibility to people in times of so many people becoming way more conscious of the dystopian reality that has always been. I mainly think I'm burnt out from contributing to social media in an unorganized way. I think black left YouTube should have been organized by now. The fact that creators like me could not create organization behind the camera to be able to fight against fascist censorship online and to collectively exemplify a lifestyle of divestment is disappointing. They decide to live conveniently and comfortably rather than radically and uncomfortably. Their extraordinary morals don't align with the oppressive systems they critique in their video essays. But importantly, their oh-so-ordinary actions and everyday activities most definitely do. They don't, for instance, join communes, start communes, live off the grid or in a kibbutz, nor relocate to a less capitalist society like Laos, Cuba, or Vietnam. And you may say that those things are impractical, that those things are very radical. And I would answer, yes, it is radical. And that is precisely the point. The issue I take with Kidology's suggestion of being truly radical and jetting off to some already communist or socialist nation, or even taking refuge in an off-grid faction is twofold. One, these radical suggestions do not operate within the general framework of BreadTube, which is important to call out because Kidology does not hold any of these values herself, so she is not arguing from her own perspective. Rather, she is critiquing what she believes to be contradictions within these creators' own ideologies. And two, to do these things, safely and without detriment to your own health or your family's desires, you need a significant amount of coin to your name. Ergo, you need to participate in capitalism. Bright tubers don't seem to have any inclination to reside under any old socialist regime. They want the socialism to come here, here being the cultures and countries they hail from and claim. They want the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, France, and whatever country to change. What good would it do for them to run away from their political endeavors, which often preaches the importance of decreasing the value of the individual and elevating the whole, mind you. To just cut and run to some other country that would present a whole new set of problems that they would have no place to critique since they would be effectively outsiders. I might find it more hypocritical to abandon your country as a leftist because it's too hard to cause the change that you want. They would be abandoning the people they so desperately claim to care about. And for what? Individualized happiness? If FAP socialism had a family, or if FD Signifier was a similar diehard socialist, which I don't think that he is, I would not expect for them to live this radically. Having a family in tow, a family that has grown used to a very westernized version of life, I don't believe it can be said in good faith that these people are hypocrites for not residing in some kind of anarcho-socialist community somewhere in the deserts. Your ideals are not something you are, much like goodness is not something you are. These are goals that you set for yourself and try to live up to in the best and most feasible way you can. I will not ask, 
for an American socialist to drop everything and move to Vietnam to serve as a radical example, even though Vietnam is honestly more capitalist than what most people seem to be aware of. I will, however, ask an American socialist why they are attempting to continuously and continuously capitalize on a non-traditional career path, even though it frequently comes at the expense of their goals. Hassan Abi or Hassan Piker, who was so kindly described as a champagne socialist by our dear friend Kidology, is a perfect example of this. Leftist streamers or debate bros are considered pariahs by BreadTube now. Unless, of course, these debate bros are Hassan Piker, the streaming world's favorite champagne socialist. I know his fans hate the criticism he receives for purchasing a mansion or luxury cars, but it is fair criticism. He chose to purchase these things, not for practical usage, but to enjoy his wealth as a young millionaire to enjoy the spoils of his success. The interesting thing about American capitalism and its federal democratic republic governance is that you can choose to run your business and live your life in almost any way you want if you have enough money to do so. Hassan has achieved great success and great wealth by both his own merit and by being propped up by the Young Turks, but also through the support given to him by not only his followers, but the creator community around him. Maybe he has done this or maybe he will, but but if he truly wanted to live by the radical principles he supports, he could have chosen to redistribute some of his wealth in the form of community support or mutual aid while still living comfortably in a modest, three, four bedroom home. I understand the arguments that he is not as bad as other companies or corporations because he is not directly exploiting anyone, but there is still an egregious contradiction between his values and his chosen lifestyle. Don't get me wrong. For all the ideas, opinions, and actions I disagree with Hassan on, it would be foolish to say that even amongst his champagne socialism, <laughs> that his platform does not at all yield some good, depending on what you're looking for. All I typed in on Google was charitable work done by Hassan, and the number of articles about the amount of charitable donations he has made by mobilizing his platform, it's outstanding. It is inevitably up to the individual viewer whether this work, this tangible work, outweighs the fundamental contradictions of his actual lifestyle. To me, it once again displays the online left's persistent failures in actually challenging the very specific cultural distinction that lives within Westerners. We are all designed to be capitalist, and most of us don't know how to exist in any other way. When a man who, like his counterparts, are presented with the choice of turning his back on these values because he is, ironically, wealthy enough to do so, he does not. Hassan, like other wealthier full-time bread tubers, has no true incentive to turn his back on American capitalism, and for me, that's expected. I understand people to be not simply walking contradictions, but they are also when their goals become too far-fetched, too unfocused, and too idealized, they become disembodied from their spoken words, internal beliefs, and actual actions. Online leftist creators are not exempt from this just because they talk a big game with an awareness that while they may not be revolutionaries, they are radicals. It is cute to be a little Delulu from time to time, but I think sometimes these internet town squares need a reality check. My name is Olaya Mule-Luren, and I am a movement lawyer, political commentator, writer, and national advocate for abolition, bail reform, black liberation, and other social justice movements. And I believe in my heart that that is incredibly valuable work, necessary work, that I am proud of. And it likely does make me a radical, but it does not make me a revolutionary. And that is okay. That is not a knock to me. These creators can cop to the fact that they are simply palatable introductions to leftist politics. But somebody said in the chat, like, are you an activist or entertainer? And I, I've never been unclear about this. I'm an entertainer, first and foremost, you know, and to, and, and, I, and I say that not just to avoid the culpability of putting out bad takes, because that doesn't happen. Like here we are today, evaluating whether or not the take I had was good or bad, but to keep in mind that I should be an on rap for certain ideologies and politics and not your and not your like last stop. And I want to introduce uh create enthusiasm around certain ideas. But that doesn't mean your standards as an audience member for some level of consistency of authenticity 
should be non-existent. Capitalism and the critique of it for such creators goes beyond the feeling of hopelessness. It evolves to an excuse for personal corruption of greed. Much like the ultimatum Kidology presented, they don't, for instance, join communes, start communes, live off the grid or in a kibbutz, nor relocate to a less capitalist society like Laos, Cuba, or Vietnam. Creators who have been elevated to the point of having the privilege of some type of choice in their engagement with capitalism also adopt an all or nothing mentality. That is to say, we all must participate so why not indulge ourselves? There's no question of self-regulation or self-control in sight. There are numerous ways of existing between these two extremes, mainly being more intentional in one's own consumption, but as a rule of thumb, unless shown otherwise, just assume that your favorite leftist video essayist or streamer is doing the same level of real world politicking as you are and hold them to the same standards you would hold yourself to. One other certainty that I believe is exemplified by both Hassan and similar creators content is that yes, they are entertainers first and foremost, but also in the online left, it's okay to be inconsistent, mean and cruel as long as you're not a bigot. The section Kidology was most invested in was the critique on cornbread tube being so white. Cornbread tube is a niche within a niche. It's made up of black Western leftist creators, so think Khadija Mambo, FD Signifier, T Noir, Fab Socialism, Tribe, Foreign Man in a Foreign Land. Kidology describes some of these top creators who are known to work collaboratively as a petite bourgeoisie that sets the tone for what voices are welcome and what voices are not. Before diving into my perspective, it's important to flush out the context of Kidology's experience with Cornbread Tube. In January of last year, Kidology posted a heavily reacted to and discussed video called Kindly Do Better. FD Signifier and some friends who all have or have had some sort of small social media presence reacted to this video on his secondary channel. They prefaced the video to the audience with many tone setting disclaimers. There's gonna be a lot of transphobia and trans like antagonistic dog whistles, dog alarms, just so like as we continue, understand that is a huge undercurrent of this video. There's also gonna be some, some anti-blackness. Mm. Um, what else we got that's like trigger worthy? Uh, let's see. General, what general trigger warning for bigotry and shit is probably gonna piss you to fuck off. Saying these things before giving listeners a chance to hear her thoughts strips away any type of charitability towards Kidology, putting her in a very precarious position. They view Kidology's positions as centrist, as ill-informed, as harmful based on the conversations around Kidology's frequent use of trans issues as examples of the online less fragmented ability to cause impactful change. Even though I don't agree with her on a lot of things, I still can appreciate that she is an exceptional journalist. And so the reasons for her resignation that I heard on Woman's Hour was truly shocking. You are saying that you specifically were not allowed uh, to, to write about this. Are you saying others were and you weren't? No, um, I was specifically not allowed. I was specifically told by upper management that I wasn't allowed to write about gender stuff in about 2018, 2019, I think. Specifically, the online left has very little to say in the way of macro issues, contrary to my Micro issues. The left has a lot to say about micro issues and I would say that trans issues are a micro issue in that they affect a small, very small minority of the modern population. I think in this the left has very much left or just abandoned the white working class. The left is lazy insofar as getting very comfortable in its own self-righteousness and in its own bubble of information because on the one hand the left lacks expertise. For instance in the way of understanding transgenderism relative to transsexualism, say, and also in understanding the medical knowledge that is needed behind transgender identities. Hello, editing me. I would hazard that a good example of this is the controversy surrounding Leah Thomas. She is known for being the first openly transgender athlete to win an NCAA Division I national championship. According to Kidology, this led to some unattended ramifications on her channel. 
My channel was reported. I lost subscribers. I lost the majority of my income. And this was all a result of the things that FD said in his response to my video and directly to me. The views on my original video suddenly stopped entirely. And all the views went to his out of context reaction to particular statements I'd made. In response, she live streamed for five to eight hours across two days to further detail her positions following along the video published by FD. She constantly expressed her disappointment with FD for not privately reaching out to her for a discussion before just reacting to her video on a public platform. Eventually, she was able to speak to FD on a live stream publicized on her channel. This conversation came after what seemed like multiple outreaches on both her and her shared audience's part. Kidology in a stream with Destiny said that she felt like she was being treated poorly by FD. I reached out to him, tried to speak with him. Uh, he just wasn't, I felt like sort of a very needy girlfriend whose boyfriend was just not interested. Um, so yeah, finally we got to speaking, but mm -hmm. it was a very difficult scenic route to actually speaking. In their conversation, nothing substantial was truly discussed and no perspectives were bridged or mended. It mostly served as a confirmation to whatever ideas you already had in your head about both creators. If you believe Kidology to be transphobic, depending on how you define this word, I'm sure those beliefs were confirmed for you. If you believed FD to be a sanctimonious asshole, I'm sure those beliefs were confirmed. If you suspected the online left is made up of people who run away from tough conversations where their identity cannot serve as a barrier against backlash, that was surely confirmed. This conversation with FD is what marked the beginning of what I like to call Kidology's lefty arc. In the streaming sphere, an arc is a significant moment or period of time for that particular creator. In this arc, we started seeing Kidology pop up in many lefty or lefty adjacent streams, from Britney Simon and Wick TV to probably most notably Destiny. I mean, I watch you uh -huh. uh, regularly, and so a lot of my opinions are actually informed by you and your conversation. Her audience got to see more of her politicized opinions and for some, that was good. And others jumped ship for what they probably saw as red flags. One of the biggest debates around Kidology herself is her experience as a black woman seems to not be what many think the black experience ought to be. Without going into too much detail into her personal background, because I personally don't care, but I know for most people, this is valuable context. So, Kidology is South African and was adopted by a white family who seemed to have some racial insensitivities. <laughs> Kidology has said a few different times that she more so aligns herself or finds herself relating more with the experiences of white people than that of black people. The definition of it has really changed a lot now, which is interesting because I sort of relate weirdly, I guess, to both, uh, maybe the initial definition far more so in that it refers to individuals who are adopted into families that are not of their race. That's sort of why I consider myself transracial. But when it comes to the internet, me being transracial has sort of been altered into this idea of me seeing myself as white. And this all stems down to this thing that I said, everything that I say is taken out of context, but this that I said about uh, looking in a mirror and being startled um, when I sort of realized that I'm black, um, that's then just sort of become this whole thing of me like having this like internalized like hatred of blackness. I'm not entirely sure why actually, but I do feel guilty about it. But whenever I sort of very subconsciously and without much thought walk past the mirror or look in a mirror, I get a bit of a shock because I realize that I'm black. And this may sound absolutely bizarre. I know. <laughs> when I say it out loud, it sounds incredibly bizarre. But even when I sort of imagine my life and project myself into my future, or even sort of project myself back into the past, looking at memories, the good and the bad, what have you, I always imagine a little white girl or a grown white woman. And 
I do think that this has a lot to do with how I grew up. I think the most profound thing that has very much influenced this image of myself, which I have in my mind of being a white individual, is to do with the fact that when I was fostered and adopted and then, well, due to circumstances, fostered again, I was only raised by white South Africans, is that I only spoke English and Afrikaans. I never spoke my native language. I never learnt or spoke Zulu. This couple with her apathy to racial plights. It's important that these cornbread tubers make it known to their audiences that we outliers are not like them. Because if people realize that there are a multitude of other ways of existing as a black person in this world, for instance, as a black person who doesn't constantly resort to blaming everybody else, grand narratives and systemic issues for this state of our existence at every possible opportunity. What would the point of their content be? Many people have called her anti-black and she in turn has called many within Cornbread Tube anti-black or anti-white. I've gone back and forth of how exactly I wanted to structure this section because there's so many complexities and nuances on this topic centering upon race that literally everyone involved has faltered in while also having made some good constructive points on. After debating with myself multiple times, I've decided the biggest things I wanted to touch on are one, the discourse around the word coup, two, tribalism from Kidology's perspective, and three, the concept of anti-whiteness. Tribalism within politics is both wholly understandable and immensely baffling to me, depending on what context you're coming from. Kidology often critiques the online left for its increasingly tribalistic tendencies, which she sees as counterintuitive to social progress and political change. Throughout her Brett Toot video, there are many, many times where I squint at her slight disregards towards Black American politics. Much like the persistent examples of trans issues in her Kindly Do Better video, the constant jab start to suggest something a little more than what is on the surface. It is no secret that Kidology has largely felt ousted, undermined, or even betrayed by Black Westerners, a phenomenon that FD refers to as the fly in the milk. I went to Cambridge and I suddenly didn't have connections, I didn't have friends, and I had to figure that out how that was going to happen. And I was very quickly exposed to critical theory, critical race theory particularly, and the assumption that because I was black, I was therefore inevitably going to join all, the, all these black societies, which I did. But it became very apparent that I was very native African. And because of that, there was a disconnect in terms of our morality, a disconnect in terms of how I saw myself and how they saw me. She has attested to not feeling the camaraderie she was so often told exists within that space and that she typically identifies more with the generalized white population than that of the black population. She never directly states that this is for cultural or ethnic reasons rather than racial ones, but that is how I tend to interpret her words here. I could be very wrong, but will run with my interpretation because it's my video. I've never been able to wrap my head around the idea of identifying with a group solely based on your race, as in your varied skin tone or phenotypical traits. I've always interpreted people, especially Americans and Canadians, referencing racial in-groups or community as racial groups as just a substitution for ethnic groups. When I hear someone explaining generalized differences in white American households versus black American households like discipline, emotional support, emphasis on schooling, they're describing cultural distinctions. Racial differences aside from the physical, it's more of a descriptor of society's interactions with your racial group. So your experiences and how they can vary depending on how you are racialized. Hence, the black experience. To my knowledge and research, the phrase black experience was by and large created by black Americans. Go figure. <laughs> What constitutes as the Black experience, which I don't believe to be synonymous necessarily with Black culture in the United States may differ depending on who you speak to, but the general definition of society's interactions with your racial group 
should encompass them all. With specificity, what I interpret the Black experience to be is a persistent undercurrent of precariousness and uncertainty that is directly related to your outward appearance. It can look different on different people depending on where you were born, how you were raised, what station you were born into, and of course, who you are. But you'll find that there are several commonalities in Western life that many Black people face. The Black experience is something Kidology heavily criticizes, stating that videos like FD's Fuck the Police would have no true purpose or meaning if people were to know that there are other ways to experience life as a Black person. It's important that these cornbread tubers make it known to their audiences that we outliers are not like them. Because if people realize that there are a multitude of other ways of existing as a black person in this world. For instance, as a black person who doesn't constantly resort to blaming everybody else, grand narratives and systemic issues for the state of our existence at every possible opportunity, what would the point of their content be? What would the point of videos like Fuck the Police serve if black people who support the institution of policing were given a thumbs up by cornbread tubers? This is one of the many points of this video that I felt was framed in such a heavily biased manner that it was to the point point of her argument's detriment. The Black experience does not necessarily paint an image of permanent economic disparagement or intense racism that will snipe out all prospects of opportunity. It's just an understanding that, for many Black people, shit tends to be a little harder. But make no mistake, Black Americans are ridiculously resilient, talented, and highly influential. The uniqueties around and consistent impact of Black American culture is not respected enough by Americans and foreigners alike. It is often disregarded and regulated to something incidental to the default culture. Black American culture isn't just the music or the AAVE dialect. It's the food, the fashion, the hair, the family values. Like every other culture, in the world, there's also subsets to it as well. Southern Black culture, especially within the Bible Belt, is distinctively different from a Northerner's Black culture. But even deeper than that, Black people from the New Orleans have variations from those who were born in Houston. It's complex, it's vast, and it deserves all the accolades. And with those accolades come several well-deserved critiques. If one is willing to applaud someone, something, or an entity, but is simultaneously unwilling to critique when necessary, I would question if that person truly respects the thing they are praising. I've said this before, but being a part of a particular group that has a particular set of conventions can be a detriment for some people. This culture group it's no different. However, the critique would not be, oh, there's multiple ways to be a Black person. It would instead be, in-groups don't elicit feelings of community for some people. Let's explore why. The answer is often not that deep and not that hard to understand. In-groups foster an in-group bias. When you don't fit within the in-groups conventions, you are typically outcasted. One of my biggest qualms with FD Signifier's content at times is that he frames Black culture and Black Americans in too far of an ideal manner. To argue that Black Americans are not generally socially conservative is untrue. That said, I again want to remind everybody that this is not an endorsement of Democrats because Democrats are also conservatives. But in the framework of how this discussion tends to go, I want to make sure I clear up these falsehoods about Black people being socially conservative because we are not. Generally speaking, Black Americans tend not to be conservative in the same manner as the white American populace and that the values being conserved are explicitly different and the why is profoundly different. But conservative nonetheless. Socially conservative is referring not necessarily to a political label, but to the belief that certain traditional values and duties need to be upheld via established institutions to uphold the fragile framework of society. Whereas this title would be granted to many white Americans with the understanding of being anti-queer, anti-secularism, things of that nature. For Black Americans, however, I'm more so referring to the conservation of traditional Black culture. In traditional Black America, I peg social conservatism to be the underlying reason as to why there are rampant ways of disgust and apprehension towards the trans community, devotion to organized religion and a strong adherence to gender roles in relation to finances and leadership within those religions, the respectability spectrum within Black spaces as it relates to natural hair, the common occurrence of child abuse within Black households, coupled with the common saying of what happens in the family stays in the family, the discouragement of sinking mental 
mental health services, and the complexities around Black women's inclinations to put the well-being of Black men above themselves in instances of intimate partner violence. Black social conservatism isn't just because we love the American way so much. It's a survival strategy. For Black people, being progressive or standing out or challenging social norms in the system is essentially a good way to get killed. Survival tactic or not, these values hinder Black Americans from substantial intercommunal growth and flourishment because conservatism of any kind encourages homogeneity, which I don't personally care for. FD's content to a non-Black person or a Black person who may not be culturally Black does indeed cause an essentialized narrative around Black community. A positive one, yes, but essentialized nonetheless. It's an unrealistic and narrow lens that could, if you were a person of truly significant power and influence, be a detriment to Black progress. And I'm not being shady here, just realistic. If your celebrity status comes from long-form content creation that does not include extensive branding product placement, and product pushing, your influence tends to live and die on the internet. The detriment would come from moving from one extreme to the other. So from the black criminality myth to black leftist idealism, neither extreme humanizes black people because we are too beings of great flaws and mistakes, not because we are black, but because we are people. While there are several black political movements and significant figures that have practiced or are currently practicing left leftist rhetoric or ideals, I've rarely clocked them as leftists, at least when I looked at them on a surface level. When I first started delving into the histories of Black political organizations in the United States, like the African Blood Brotherhood, the Black Radical Congress, Black Liberation Army, and of course, the Black Panthers, I wondered if I was going to see intersectionality exercise, if they would partner with non-Black people to push their movements far beyond the confines of Black community. This was an aspect missing from major feminist movements. However, you'll find that the common principles of womanism, not to be confused with feminism, and intercommunalism post-Black Panther era being so prevalent throughout most of these organizations. So the answer is kind of, yeah, there was intersectionality. Well, aside from the flex of separatism and black nationalism. Womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender. This term womanist first appeared in the works of Alice Walker, where it was loosely defined as a woman who loves other women, who appreciates and prefers women's culture, women's emotional flexibility, women's strength. A womanist is not a separatist though. She's committed to survival and wholeness of an entire people. Womanism led with the plights of the common black woman rather than the common white woman. Under the leadership of Huey P. Newton, the Black Panthers adopted his principle of intercommunalism, which was inspired by Marxism. In short, intercommunalism refers to the idea that in the pursuit of true liberty, all communities globally must work together. Newton's thesis of intercommunalism is imperialism leads to reactionary intercommunalism, to revolutionary intercommunalism, to pure communism and anarchy. Hence the shift from the Black Panthers' Black nationalism to more Marxist-Leninist calls to action in their 10-point program. Uh, the Women's Liberation Front, uh, some of the groups are, uh, are political, politically conscious. Those uh, groups of women who are politically conscious, uh, we would like to unite with them, uh, and we would like to also uh, uh, have unity with the homosexual groups who are also politically conscious. Uh, we've had meetings with the homosexual uh, representatives of the homosexual group and uh, also the, uh, the Women's Liberation Front. Now, the homosexual group uh, have been uh, oppressed so uh, much and so badly until uh, it was hard to convince them that uh, the Black Panther Party uh, uh, is relating to them. But uh, we see uh, that uh, uh, homosexuals are human beings and uh, they are oppressed because of the bourgeois mentality and the bourgeois treachery uh, that uh, exists in this country. All this to say, intersectionality, though never complete nor perfect, existed in these Black-led, Black-focused movements because there was an understanding that liberation comes with everyone's liberation, not just the group you happen to be a part of. Whether you agree with the methodologies, the principles, the teachings, the political theories, or angles of these kinds of movements, 
that's irrelevant to my point. The dichotomy I see between past black movements and the like, and our friend Ibram X. Kendi, and not just FD Signifier, but BreadTube as a whole, because the same argument can be applied to any identity group, is not the lack of physical radicalism or the desire to be revolutionaries, but the desire to thoroughly learn, understand, and present information on identities you do not share. It is one thing to platform and showcase people of these varying identities and attempt to learn from them, but it is another to sit in the information, humanize it, and apply it in a similarly passionate manner they would do for their own groups. Why I am, obviously, aware of the leftist philosophical postulations that exist on BreadTube, the question I am posing here is, is one truly a leftist politically when one's interests remain isolated to only themselves? I don't don't mean this by way of individuality, by the way, but by the bolstering and learning expansively about only one's own group or groups. I distinctly said leftists politically because leftist rhetoric has unfortunately spilled over into people's ethics and morality. So people speak like leftists often without even realizing it because its general principles have become lumped in to internet culture. In my perspective, politics is not just about one's own identity group. And I say that as someone who has great respect for the concept of identity politics, though it has been very bastardized. <laughs> There is value in understanding the parts of the whole. For all the talk of intersectionality, where BreadTube politically lacks is interconnectivity. FD's political philosophy and framework, from what I can glean from his platform, can be made applicable to not only Black-centric issues, but Latino and Asian disparities as well. But we rarely see him do that. Jesse Gender's political philosophy can be applied to racialized and economic plights as well, but she only speaks to trans or queer relative issues expansively. I don't find this to be innately negative. People speak to what they know, but if you are someone who takes BreadTube as more than just entertainers with a slightly educational, heavily politically biased spin, then you should be asking why is what they know only in reference to what they experience. I thought this to be obvious, but it's because they're not true to God political pundits. A political pundit is someone who speaks in an authoritative manner on political issues. Think Thomas Friedman or Maureen Dodd. Notably, most political pundits are pretty on top of present day happenings, whether that be the Israeli-Palestine conflict, Chinese tensions around Taiwan, or the population crisis in Japan. Political pundits speak on these issues sometimes from a very well-rounded perspective, even though their takes may vary in consideration. And sometimes it can be from a more surface level, Wikipedia-informed perspective. This differs from most of the popular bread tubers who are normally just thoughtful individuals who happen to subscribe to left-leaning philosophies. What outlies creators like Hassan or Destiny, and please spare me the comments about how much you guys hate him. <laughs> I get it, even though most of you are very bad at explaining why. Trust me, I get it. But what outlies them from FD, Jesse Gender, or Philosophy Tube is that the former do not only speak from what they experience or know, probably to their own detriment, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> It's not to say that these video essays are too stupid or too myopic to do so. I think it's much more of just disinterest. And when you're disinterested in a topic, it's hard to creatively pin a feature length essay. One of the most contrary things that I found to be genuinely funny in Kidology's video is her critique of Cornbread 2's use of the word not because I don't have my own qualms around it or with it, but because I cannot be convinced that she truly gives a damn. <laughs> When she references a small creator by the handle name Soul Bunny's video being propped up by FD for a man and crew, it seemed like a by the way footnote that Soul Bunny referenced the leftist streamer Shark as a c amongst other hurtful terms. Soul Bunny's video seemed to be primarily referenced because Kidology dubbed it to be anti white, which we'll get into in the next section. FD and friends hold the power in this space in influencing the growth or otherwise of their friends. Take, for instance, Soul Bunny, an artist and video essayist whose video essays are not only openly anti-white and racist, but are just not good. The only people that need to be doing bake sales and going door to door
for are other white people. I can keep this going all day, but let's get into this podcastity. All of these white people and, you know, even some Asian people were basically accusing me of attacking this this innocent white woman who was just appreciating the culture. But the thing. I don't know why this is a debate. That's a lie. That's a bold faced lie. I know why. It's because people are much too lazy to find genuine critiques in people's content because that requires work and consideration. So they point to the most surface level thing that they can semantically label as hypocrisy. The term coon is thrown around way too often online, but not in the way that Kidology presents. They determine who is truly black and who isn't, which in their eyes gives them the authority to use the exact same kind of derogatory racist language that creates the very divisions they claim to want to overcome in the first place. Let me tell you what I find frustrating about coons and their belief that they have that question to make. This is the problem with, with like and internalized anti-blackness and wanted to be in proximity of whiteness, right? I'm over talking because I think I agree with the fact that we've all, yes, say. Not only is c a racist slur. It is also described by the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia as follows. The c caricature is one of the most insulting of all anti-black caricatures. The name itself, an abbreviation of raccoon, is dehumanizing. As with Sambo, the c was portrayed as a lazy, easily frightened, chronically idle, inarticulate buffoon. She understands the word as a way of policing another's blackness, like when she utilizes Candace Owens as an example of another way to exist as black. FD and friends don't check their own cliquey and black purist tendencies, and they definitely demonstrate their lack of knowledge of what blackness means to a diverse spectrum of people, cultures, experiences, and political interpretations, not just in the United States, but across the world wide web on which they work. It is understood that Kidology's perception is that Cohen's is called a coon because she is not black enough to get it or to understand the struggle. No, no. It's because she's willing to stomp on the very foundations of black culture, continue its demonization and weaponize her own blackness in an attempt to discredit other black people in efforts to uplift a racist perception of black community. Owens undermines and dismisses black people's obvious distinctive experiences to bolster this flawed and frayed idea of one American, as in one is American first and whatever race second. She is called a because her politics show a desire to withhold systemic acknowledgement and restructuring in a way that would not only serve black people, but all of the marginalized. That being said, I do disagree with FD's assertion that is not a slur. Who made you king of the blacks, FD signifier? Why do you think all black people should think alike? <laughs> is a racist slur. Is it? Is it? Or are you a If you Google the history of the term and click on literally the very first link and do no other research because you're lazy or not as smart as you and your fans think you are, you might get the idea that the term only existed as a pejorative term used against black people by white people connected to these racist caricatures from minstrelsy. Or at least that's what the Jim Crow Museum might indicate to you. But if you actually know how to do real research and maybe go through the hard work to go to like literally the very next Google entry, you might find an article that leads you on a long journey into the history of this work. And this caricature is used as a derogatory term toward poor and enslaved black people by white people. That much is true. But from there, the word eventually takes on a new purpose, as many words tend to do historically, especially in black American culture. The way is used by black people in black spaces right now is not as a slur is a label. It most certainly is. It's a racially derogatory term reformed by black people to label and classify other black people who are deemed as traitors. It is meant to insult, to shame, and to demean one's social standing within black society. And my dear, I just don't give a damn. Both culturally and linguistically, slurs are not equal, and the reasons are largely arbitrary. Sometimes it may have something to do with some type of recent event or history. Sometimes it's pure feeling and emotion. And other times it's because of power structures and power imbalances. Because what is truly the difference between a 
Brown, a whitewashed black person, and an Oreo, besides historical contexts. All of them, after all, are used to describe a black person who either abhors or sells out other black people. We've just collectively decided that for the time being, this particular synonym is going to outrank the others. My problem with this term and all other pejorative labels like racist, sexist, or misogynist when it comes from this sphere on YouTube is that the label is primary and the reasoning is secondary at best. And the reasoning, if it is even given at all, is loose, padded with a couple examples that show that there are present day assumptions being made about someone's character because of a past action. In FD's most recent Brett Toot video, I was excited to see and understand his perceptions on what he and numerous others called debate bros. At the time, I had never watched any debate streamers because of disinterest, but I've always heard whisperings about them. And all we got is a quick montage that I was like, Where's the context? Where's the flushed out argument, sir? A brief list of the offensive, egregious, and indefensible things done and said, both past and present, would be longer than most of their stream. Like, it would be so easy for me to just, like, cobble together a handful of their worst moments and just put it out there as evidence of how bullshit this all was but that would be beneath me. Or is it? Black music and suicide, like most depictions of black culture, will mostly glorify rags to riches story, stories, money, and sex for white people as well. I don't know if you've noticed this, but a ton of poor white people also smoke crack. It's a poor people drug. It's just most black people in America are poor, and that's why we associate it like that. Things are considered private, uh, whether intentional or unintentionally, you start to develop negative attitudes and thoughts about certain people, or you can make those words more pervasive in society in such a way that you help other people have negative thoughts. When FD spoke of Bill Cosby's treachery to black people, I understood even though I had never followed or kept up to date with Bill Cosby outside of his trials. His arguments were backed with numerous examples and very well explained. Where was that level of diligence and care when it came to applying character evaluations to other online figures? But even if FD, Soul Bunny, or Kidology could back up their arguments of someone being a racist, a anti-black or anti-white, should they ascribe that label to them? I have a personal preference to not on my public platform, that is, because I want people to hear the arguments without feeling isolated. What you glean from my arguments can be your own personal takeaway. That said, if I made a video about someone like Candace Owens and you don't leave with the sentiment that she is anti-black, then I've done something very wrong. Even with that being my preference, there is usefulness in applying labels, but you shouldn't rely on the label in and of itself as the foundation and cornerstone of your arguments. But all snark aside, there is something truly wrong with the value system on the online left, because a video essay is can make an argument about why a term is not a slur and feel justified in doing so. A streamer can have obvious vendettas against other leftists. They can make videos about why one spirit of left tube is better than the other, they can call people stupid, uneducated, or vapid. In other words, they can all be dead on jerks, but as long as you're not a bigot, which fluctuates in when and why someone has ascribed that label, you're good. It's such a low bar. <laughs> When Kidology describes the right being more diverse in membership when it comes to differing ideologies and principles, she is wrong. And I think another thing that the right really has in its favor is that the right is very accepting of a diverse membership. When we look at the political spectrum and we look at that segment, which is designated to the right from the center right to the ultra orthodox right, there is a lot going on and there is a lot of space for a lot of different identities. You can be conservative in values without being religious. You can be a conservative atheist. Because clearly, the online left is just as diverse in that regard. I have very few steadfast moral or ethical principles, and even I can see how morally bankrupt and inconsistent the online left can be. I'm not even talking about niceties or kindness. I'm just talking about having enough respect for your audiences to actually flush out your thoughts and opinions on other creators you share the platform with. And Kidology is not exempt from this 
nor am I. The amount of digging I had to do with some of these examples Kidology presented made me go into rabbit holes that when I got to the bottom of them, I was disappointed by. For example, Kidology called Foreman's video title When You're Racist But Gay a disingenuous hit piece towards the trans leftist creator and, and former Canadian Communist Party candidate Keffels. This was Foreign Man in a Foreign Land's original thumbnail and title on a video in which he disingenuously goes after the internet's largest transgender streamer Keffels. In this case, he went after her for being in rehab. This led me to watching Four Man's video several times because, quite frankly, I didn't really understand his points. Not because I'm dense, but because the video was a little discombobulated when it came to the insertion of the interview clips. But due to this confusion, I searched for critiques and reactions to the video, hopefully from other leftist video essayist creators that I knew of. However, because Four Man is a part of the Brett Tube clique, the petite bourgeois, of course there was nothing, except for a few streams from a different side of left tube that had very interesting but uncharitable takes. But they did introduce me to Noodlegate. I hadn't previously noticed the noodle references in the example tweets Foreman used to exemplify Keffel's bigotry. <laughs> I started researching this right on time too, because serendipitously, Keffels began rehashing the Noodlegate drama around the same time. About a year ago, Keffels, whose then claim to fame was largely just being an asshole to bigots on Twitter, was exposed for taking part in ridiculing a journalist by the name of Rosalind, who tweeted about an Asian cuisine cookbook that was published by a white author. During Rosalind's appearance in Soul Bunny's video essay, see how all the lore is connected here, huh? She explained that it was a shit post made out of irritation of seeing Western white people continuously appropriating other cultures. Keffel's initial involvement came from a few flippant tweets that were retroactively discovered by Rosalind after Keffel started to become more relevant and more of a staple figure. Keffel's wasn't as big at the time, but she had also piled on. So Keffel's was like quote tweeted it at the end of everything, and I didn't know who she was. Um, but about a year later, when I saw that Keffels had um, piled on to the original discourse, I was like, oh shit, like, now I know, like, I knew who she was by that point. And it was the first time I saw her tweet where she was just like, because noodles are tasty. I just like, I was just like, that's the whitest thing I've ever seen. One of the tweets by Keffels that some people now label as a racist dog whistle was noodles are tasty. I'm not joking. It was dubbed a racist dog whistle, I think think because people interpreted it as a way to undermine the argument of cultural appropriation, especially since it had come from a woman of color. Keffels had many different responses to this entire charade, one being adopted the noodles are tasty thing as an in-community joke and disproportionately responding to Rosalind, who to my knowledge has no significant platform on YouTube, by doing an entire stream on her a few months ago that outlined what Keffels saw as hypocrisies and inconsistencies in some of Rosalind's own articles. I call it disproportionate, not just because of the sheer platform differences, but because of the intense deep dive into Rosalind's unrelated works. But that stream came after for a man's video, so I don't consider it as a piece of the pie as to why he views her as racist. But yeah, Noodlegate is one of the major reasons why some label Keffels as a racist. See. The thing is, I think this is stupid. I don't care too much about Twitter discourse. That platform needs to be studied because it seems to do something to people's minds where it brings out the stupidest and most reactionary sides out of them. If Keffels is the racist that four men and the light like claim her to be, then that is something you would be able to detect in her content. She is primarily a streamer, so we should be able to see some patterns in her logic or lack thereof. There's a lot of content to shift through and build that argument if you really want to. One might be able to build an argument in the same way I believe Soul Bunny was attempting to, which is based on how she responds to people of color versus white people. I would argue that once again, her responses to Soul Bunny's critique or hit piece on leftist streamers was disproportionate as well. While I can understand wanting to bite back at someone you feel ridiculed or slander at you, I still care about not only the platform differences, but the longevity of online careers and the amount of time spent clapping back. Keffels has been around online for a good little minute. She has a strong and supportive audience that is willing to go to bat for her. I would have concerns with how some within her audience could react to the smaller party she is engaging in discourse with, at least when it comes to discussing it on her wider YouTube or Twitch platforms. If it stays on Twitter, 
Yeah. And this is a critique going towards an online figure who is intimately familiar with these types of ramifications considering her past doxing and her own understandings of disproportionate responses. She, a significantly larger creator, basically gave the signal to everyone to dismiss all of my criticisms and in fact to escalate the harassment even further. The worst part about all of this is how disproportionate it is. I only have 43,000 subscribers on my main YouTube channel and I'm getting my reputation dragged through the mud by people who have tens of millions of subscribers collectively between all their platforms. But for one to build that argument of Keffels being racist for how she responds to people of color, one would also have to analyze how she responds to white creators and evaluate how the instances are similar or dissimilar. Because I have not done that research, nor do I care to for this particular creator, and because both Soul Bunny and Four Man's videos fail to build sufficient arguments, I'm not gonna call Keffels racist. I would call her many other things, primarily obsessive, overly emotional and prone to reactionary responses. If we're considering her recent defense and then quick rescindment of that defense of Vosh in reference to his predilections. But to my point regarding Kidology inadvertently referencing this debacle, it took hours of watching content for me to fully form my opinion on her singular statement of four men disingenuously went after a large trans streamer. And it was important for me to do this deep dive alongside a couple of others because how Kidology frames outside dramas, what examples she uses, how little effort she puts into flushing out certain examples, all of these factors go into my overall analysis of her video and pinpointing where I believe Believe she either falters or succeeds. The point is not to care about Noodlegate or Keffels, but to see how Kidology's perception of Foreman Man was colored. And similar to how Foreman Man's points referring to Keffels within the confines of his video, Kidology's critique was weak. It seems to me when there is something that these creators see in another that they disapprove of, goes against their moral, ethical, or political codes, or that they just don't like, the creator in question becomes frozen in their minds. They become beyond reproach, beyond the ability to grow, and beyond anything other than the label that they've put onto them. This is a practice that, as an individual, it's fine. If you are around during the time of X creator dropping the N-word and you dub them a racist and never turn back, I have nothing to say to you. But it becomes a little different when you're a creator, an essayist that prides yourself on the level of research that you do, the amount of empathy you extend to abstract concepts, the amount of forethought that goes into your work, and you don't care to thoroughly explain yourself. This may be a result of trying to cover something when there's too much bad blood, so like this entire video of Kidologies that is rampant with feelings of disenchantment or Keffel's creating desperate weird hit pieces that calls for a man out for faking his accent and attempting to force him to pay for his father's sins. It could also be out of loyalty or allegiance. Noah Sampson's debate bro critique and subsequent conversation with Vosh where he was unable to succinctly defend himself and his stances, not out of contempt towards debate streamers or Vosh, but out of respect and camaraderie for his spear on YouTube and Professor Flowers, of course. I think it's cute that these bright tubers have their communities, their groups, and their loyalties. It's endearing to see people bat for one another, even when I think the drama is stupid or leads to inexplicable quick categorizations. But I only think that because I don't see them as thought leaders. There's no shade in that statement. I don't think they want that responsibility, nor have I really seen a lot of them try to assume it. Just because you or I see someone as something doesn't mean they are that thing. Just because an audience member may see Cat Black or ContraPoints as their token trans creators that they only go to to learn about things from the perspective of a trans woman doesn't mean that these women assume the responsibility of acting as the voices of the trans community. Kidology accuse FD and crew for trying to speak for the black community when they aren't even the common American black person. These cornbread tubers, like their white liberal counterparts, espouse attitudes and policy preferences that are largely unrepresentative of the marginalized communities whose will they claim to represent. They espouse the same luxury beliefs. Now I could be wrong because there's hours of content on all of these channels, but I've never seen or heard the sentiment from FD or his spear. I see that they are very aware of their differences in stations and differences in growing up. Both my parents are college educated. My daddy is an architect, my mommy is a CPA. Because of that, 
it was never a question whether or not I was going to school, going to college. I knew that was a part of the natural order of things. There's a difference between being broke and being structurally like impoverished. At the end of the right. day, even if I have zero dollars to my name, I'm from a socioeconomic class, a walk in life where I have friends and people that would be I could even get money from. That again is a reflection of like where I actually occupy, which is if you look at left tube and a lot of the online left, these are all uh, college educated petite bourgeois folks, white and black, and in between that have built these platforms. And we are all speaking to uh, petite bourgeois, white and black folks who are, who can consume the content and, you know, discuss and think about the politics without actually facing the ramifications and, um, you know, uh, ramifications of what those politics mean in the real world. And so I, 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 most of my, Pretty much all of what I have here is meant to be aimed at the space I occupy, which is somewhat different than what you all do here on Black Brown Media. On their platforms, they have always spoken from a Black leftist or Black activist lens. Both are radical political perspectives. There is a stark difference between doing what we're all doing on this platform, sharing our thoughts and opinions, and what Kidology has suggested that Corn Brunt Tube is doing, speaking for the identity groups they happen to be a part of. Anti-whiteness, another cornerstone of the bread tube critique. Admittedly, I have a hard time with the anti-white thing. Not because I don't think it's possible to be racist against white people. I subscribe to the academic assertion that there are multiple forms of racism, including individualized, cultural, systemic, and symbolic, which all inform one another in some way. But here, when I'm talking about racism levied against the majority racial group, I am referring to individualized racism only. My issue isn't about accepting the existence of it, but understanding the totality of it. Whenever I hear someone bring up racism against white people, it's always in response to the invalidation of their argument, a critique to a certain word choice or tone, or just kind of being asinine and cheeky. This concept of anti-white rhetoric is only ever used as a weapon against the racially marginalized as a point of hypocrisy. In other words, I've never seen someone truly give a damn about the semantics of anti-whiteness. And if you don't care, presumably as the white person in question, why would anyone else? It's almost like if an argument is made for the sole purpose of contradicting someone else, it's almost like it's not something that truly affects white people on a deep or significant scale. Contextually to the West, there is not a strong argument for anti-whiteness existing on a systemic or institutional level. Therefore, there is no argument for othering via the state, which is one of my primary concerns. From a cultural lens, an argument can be made, I suppose, if you are someone who is not truly in tune with other cultural groups, that is. Culturally, Western racial minorities tend to have, I guess, an apathy towards whiteness. And notice I said whiteness, not white people. Whiteness is the abstract essentialist construct of a white person. Whiteness refers to an investment in racialized power, even when it does not significantly impact the singular white person's life. We are socialized to see white people as a whole people. In media, we are shown different archetypes of white representation. The accuracy of them may vary, but because there are so many kinds, and are so vast, you cannot watch TV shows or movies and leave with the idea of a white person can only be this one thing. We see this again in how we are frequently presented American history particularly. We see white people do horrible things, white people do great things, white people who did good things by accident. There is no inherent link shown between the person in question's disposition in relation to their whiteness. White people just are. Because first and foremost, they are, to all of us, a people group. That's not frequently the case for the indigenous, for the Latino, Polynesian, or Asian populations. We tend to be identity first and person second, if that secondary threshold is ever even allowed. There are large numbers of white people who have rarely been in contact with anyone of a different race. Because of that, their socializations in reference to different looking people is very minimal and made up of whatever stereotypes they've accepted from those around them, as well as what they absorb through media. Opposingly, 
racial minorities are always in proximity to white people. How can we not humanize them, even when we don't want to? Have you not noticed that white people get caveated with so many disclaimers when making generalizations? For example, Kidology references a TikTok of a white Southern woman who stitched a video of another TikTok creator who is known to be unhinged. Where in the world is this possible? Because I would like to go there and contribute. Well, shit fire and save matches. Somebody woke up on the wrong side of the bed today. Seems like she's wanting to go back to the 1700s where everybody was just mean to everybody else. Honey, if you want to go somewhere where you want to contribute to that little factor, why don't you come on down to the south? You know, I mean, because apparently we're racist towards everybody. And we don't, we don't pop nobody for being racist towards anybody else. That's a myth. The summation of the Southern woman's argument was essentially that the racist South is a myth because of how she perceived the treatment of people within her hometown. Yes, we all know not every single person in the South is racist, but the South itself is hella racist. Racist in a way many Northerners and Westerners are completely unaware of. That's not to say which region is necessarily more racist. It's just to say that racism can be diverse. Diverse in a way that people like this young woman would not necessarily understand because, go figure, she's not the one on the receiving end of said racism. Now, I believe in the South, a lot of the racism is very much linked to the increased number of discriminatory infrastructures that existed and currently exist within the South. These infrastructures have, yes, affected the general populace irrespective of race, as suggested by the continued considerably high poverty rates within the Southern region of the United States. There are also lasting implications that impact the minority populations within that region in much different ways. There are several studies suggesting a racial disparity with respect to black women in healthcare in the South, especially within the realm of OBGYN related services. Texas, with its diverse racial splits, is persistently one of the highest states alongside Florida with reports of discrimination in the workplace based on race, color, or national origin. Something interesting about the EEOC statistics is that you'll notice that the state with the highest reporting of these case types are states that have very high Hispanic populations. So that's an interesting correlation. That has nothing to do with my overall point in reference to the South. I just wanted to point it out because amidst these very black versus white conversations, we tend to forget that other races and ethnicities exist and are sometimes experiencing disparities far greater than that of both the general black and white populations. There's a certain kind of white Southern people are normally thinking of when they're talking about overt races. The Notoriously, rednecks and hicks. Oh, hold up. There are a particular subset of rednecks that are kind of chill. I, for one, have very fond memories of mud trucking on undeveloped golf courses in my younger years. So, Let's be more specific. Normally, these racist rednecks sport Confederate gear that is tied to the identity of the Old South and, hypocritically, fly the battle flag right next to the American flag. So now we need to be more specific. White Southerners who are rednecks that typically wave the battle flag tend to be racist. However, Despite the battle flag being largely recognized as a racist symbol, in some areas, it is not. Under these circumstances, religion is often looked to as a correlating factor to the likeliness of racism, considering the long-lasting link between certain forms of Christianity and white supremacy. So maybe now we need to caveat our distinguishments with religion, but what kind of Christianity? Evangelicals? Catholics? We can keep going down this rabbit hole until we have every ultra-Pacific label cataloged. When you push people on, what kind of white person, it will usually yield and give more specifications. But this humanization is rarely experienced the other way around. Even in spaces of liberally minded white people, you tend to still run into a bit of an issue when it comes to inadvertent othering, tokenization, or for just simply being, for example, the alt black chick. I find that when I'm around other racial minorities, this may still occur, but they tend to be a lot more aware of it when these kinds of things are happening, probably because it's a very niche, very specific experience that they've undergone themselves. The root of most forms of racism is dehumanization, and dehumanization is easier when you do not experience, see, or hear from the other. Because it is nearly impossible to escape the humanity of white people in the West, I find myself at odds with the concept of anti-white being so prevalent. 
sentiment. I do think it's a bit easier online to see the sentiment because people don't think about how their words are going to hit someone else's ears. In racialized conversations online, especially on TikTok, I find that it is indeed more acceptable to demean or speak down to white people and feel justified in doing so. There's a growing concern that some people have around traditionally marginalized people operating in non-traditional online spaces in an authoritarian manner. It's a concern that Kidology has expressed. Online, marginalized people do often wield more power, or rather an illusion of it, than that of a white person with no intersections to marginalization. With this slight power dynamic shift, I think you can begin to see the same patterns form against the traditional majority group. And I don't think this should be an unexpected shift either, because are we not Westerners? I keep coming back to the left's inability to attack the root of Western culture, which I find to be largely influenced by capitalist notions because it helps explain why we see some contradictions arise. I don't believe some marginalized peoples feel justified in attacking the white majority online because they are truly anti-white. I think it's because, for the first time, they feel like they have some sense of power some sway, and people get drunk on it. Could that lead to anti-whiteness? I think that depends on how much influence you believe the internet has on people's minds and actions offline. I often see creators and influencers say that the internet has a big offline impact, but there is a strong bias there because the internet is what influences their lives the most. Much like the comment section under the TikTok example Kidology presented, people lead with their own personal experiences, notwithstanding the other experiences around them. The personal becomes the reality for most. To this day, I have not seen a significant shift in people's offline actions to justify the inflated arguments of anti-whiteness Kidology has presented. But enough about Brad 2 for now. Let's talk about Kidology. I have an analogy for you. Around the 17th century, Dias were typically connected to the Latin philosophy of Dias or Dios, or an act of God. This type of Dias typically believed that while there is an entity that serves as a god or in a godlike capacity, this entity was more of a spectator than the supreme judge of one's life, as many monotheistic religions believe. To some, this assertion is even more frightening and distasteful than a supposedly benevolent god damning millions to hell for simply not believing or fulfilling arbitrary principles of good deeds, or opposing having no belief. Under this type of generalized deist belief, one would be accepting the notion that God is nothing but a creator. A creator without a true care of what happens to the life it has created. A creator that is perfectly content with watching humanity's prolonged destruction of itself for its own underrepresented reasonings. Forms of apoliticism bring the politically engaged, the politically aware, the politically involved, the same sinking, untrusting feeling that the religious often experience when talking to this type of deist. I find the label of apolitical for those who choose to don it to be a bit of a misnomer. The apolitical are often heavily politically engaged, aware, and vocal. Apoliticism for vocal critics requires a working knowledge base. When I posted a highly critical video of the online left, I was met with much of the same backlash as Kidology minus the accusations of transphobia and anti-blackness. I was called plenty of other things though. I found myself very irritated with people's weird critiques, if I'm being generous, for things that I found incredibly inconsequential, like because I frequently swap around the words leftist and liberal. Not because I'm unaware of the political differences, but because I'm American and we colloquially swap the words around. When I speak to people offline, they tend to go, huh? When I say leftist, but when I say liberal, however, they're able to immediately make a connection to either Gen Z, millennials, or the online left. The reality of the situation for leftists in the United States is that you guys hold no political or economic power. So no one gives a fuck about your labels and your microcosms. But nevertheless, I still shifted my language to suit my left-leaning audience to facilitate conversations. One of the weirdest hurdles I find that I've had to hop over in order to break into the lefty sphere was mitigating my apolitical label, mostly because I've never felt like describing it because it really doesn't mean what you guys think it does, nor do I think people would really care even if I did. As soon as you label yourself, you are cast. As soon as Kidology began her video with the disclaimer that she is apolitical, 
she inadvertently cast herself. She could have made the most brilliant, eloquent points that spoke to many, and many online leftists would have still attacked her for that reason alone. But to begin, apoliticism is an umbrella term. A writing that I found interesting on the Philosophy Documentation Center's website relative to this conversation was recently published by Mahai Silagi Gel, where apoliticism is analyzed as a political philosophy. The author recognized apoliticism as a unique term that incorporates a variety of meanings and definitions that sometimes seemingly contradicts one another. Working off the definitions and postulations of multiple political philosophers and theorists, Silagi Gel identifies a distinction between apolitics and antipolitics. Antipolitics is the apathetic nature you guys tend to refer to. Generally, it speaks to a lack of interest, no preference for alternative political agendas, any lack of participation. Apolitics, however, is in and of itself a political phenomenon and is often a form of political critique. Apolitics can spawn for a multitudinous of reason. At its core, it rejects a particular mechanism of politics, while anti-politics rejects the pursuit of politics altogether. Under Silagy Gao's thesis, institutions of the official system of politics may become apolitical if disintegrated into factional interests, which disregard their impact upon political community. Meaning, in the United States, the fractured trust and precariousness of our two-party system, where the values of the two dominant parties are rarely aligned, apoliticism, when critical, can rise as an alternative way of interpreting and debating issues related to that distribution of power. Apoliticism, where it be anti-politics or apolitics is a direct result of the institution's failure in most cases, especially if it impedes voluntary engagement and free discussion, which is the realm that we enter very frequently online. Kinology's apolitical label seems to be more aligned with anti-politics. Why do I speak about politics if I'm apolitical? Well, the thing is, to be apolitical, by definition, is to have no interest or involvement in political affairs. I'm not involved in political affairs. I don't get involved in politics. Uh, I don't vote. Uh, I vote, well, I'm, I lie. I vote at, at general elections, mainly out of respect to the suffragettes for what they did uh, in the UK, okay? I'm a minority. I appreciate and respect and I've reconciled myself to the fact that in the UK I have no political power or influence. And I'm fine with that. However, I would not say this is because of a lack of interest of learning, but a disinterest in participation only due to political poverty. Silagy Gal denoted that there are two political conditions that lend themselves to apoliticism, extra political and supra political conditions. Extra political is when there is not enough to become informed, to share, or to engage. In a super political environment, however, so many things count as political that the voluntary character of free political behavior cannot gain space. We currently reside in this environment online. All things are political, right? Too much can lead to impassivity in some people, especially devotedly individualistic creators like Kidology. When there are too many routes in politics, politics, too many causes, too many battles, it can be indicative of the current cushiness of society at large. Yes, the marginalized are still, indeed, marginalized, but we are less marginalized relatively speaking, which is why so much time can be allotted to certain academic conversations regarding cultural appropriation, digital blackface, Asian phobia, and anti-blackness within the black and Asian communities respectively. While these discussions can speak to greater systemic and cultural plights, there's no true urgency behind them, relatively speaking. However, groups that I would not subscribe a label of a lack of urgency to are trans people, are Latino immigrants, are people under warring conditions, any group that is currently being expressively and poignantly targeted by the state. Over the last few years, while only a handful of them have actually been passed, across the United States, several bills targeting trans people's ability to lead peaceful, fulfilling lives have been introduced. This is not what I would call a micro issue. In her Kindly Do Better video, Kidology consistently referred to trans issues as micro issues, not in a manner that is necessarily devaluing their importance, but with respect to the trans population small numbers. When Bellamy says that my idea of micro issues is uh, ridiculous, um, I think I definitely failed in explaining a lot of things. I made a lot of assumptions. When I say micro issues, I mean, I mean problems that are going on in your world. When I say micro issues, I mean problems going on 
in the world. Okay, there's a very important distinction. So I would say that a micro issue is trans issues, for instance, insofar as these are issues which pertain to less than a percentage point of the global population. But realistically, people globally, they're not thinking about trans issues. That is in part one of the reasons that people felt like they had their smoking guns to label her transphobic. I don't hold this perspective of kidology, but I do take issue with how she evaluates socioeconomic disparities in relation to population size. While I understand and even support her idea of the online left needing to sway the majority group, I don't believe it has to be done by abandoning the marginalized, nor do I believe the tribulations of the marginalized will be resolved by fixing the majority group's concerns. The fixation on the white working class has rarely surmounted to sustainable changes for other groups, notably because issues tend to affect racialized people differently. The sheer disproportionality between black and white people when it comes to poverty rates, the lack of upward mobility, and the likeliness of downward mobility speaks to something different than just class disparities. When we are consistently observing trends that considerably affect one group versus another, why would we not stop to analyze the most harshly affected? While poverty may generally affect racial groups differently, there are still commonalities that can serve to build a bridge, but we shouldn't fail to recognize that the blanket solution probably won't resolve the micro concerns. For instance, in both the United States and Canada, there is a housing crisis. Most people cannot reasonably afford a home due to shortages, high mortgage interest rates, and landlords attempting to recoup pandemic losses. A popular leftist solution is to push for rent control and non-market housing. But these solutions, like their liberal counterparts, as well as conservatives, have a blind spot when you evaluate it from a more racialized lens. Many zoning laws in the United States are completely antiquated, and several more were conveniently introduced right after the repeal of the Jim Crow laws in an attempt to exclude people of color from certain affluent areas. This is actually a huge point of contention in Massachusetts right now, which is one of the most expensive places to live in the United States. Because small to medium-sized multifamily housing units are disproportionately used by people of color, correcting or reworking zoning laws would directly correlate with people of color being relieved of housing insecurity. Because again, different groups of people are going to be impacted more significantly by different actions. This type of evaluation does not live to only assist or protect people of color. It is something that can benefit all of society if multifamily housing was able to be built more freely. But by using this lens of focus, we would have not only discovered yet another way to assist the majority, but to shed light on yet another racialized disparity. And now we can attempt to build another bridge. Solutions are not one size fits all. That's the problem with the intense focus on only the white working class majority, which has been in decline since the late 80s. While the white working class may have little economic power, they still have large numbers. And while they are underserved, they are not traditionally targeted. The pure lack of power of the trans community is a component as to why legislature felt so emboldened to push discriminatory bills for. Why not pass a national bill that states that in athletics, sex shall be recognized based solely on a person's reproductive biology and genetics at birth. That also advocates for a biased study when the group targeted has no power in money, population, or political power. There are so many concerning points of House Bill 734 or the protection of women and girls and Sports Acts of 2023, which has passed the House vote but is not expected to pass Senate, and even if it does, it is expected for Biden to veto it. But I wanted to take a moment and flush this out to show that while this is an issue that targets trans people, why it will not only affect them and why it is enough even if it does. I interpret defining sex based on a person's reproductive biology and genetics at birth as discriminatory against both trans and intersex people, specifically because it creates another foundational barrier between them and life. This is yet another barrier that prohibits this particular demographic from living and acting freely because their biological bodies do not align with their gender identities or because their biological distinctions are far more complex than that of the colloquial binary of sex. Notice that I am not contextualizing this to only sports, even though this bill is specific to sports, because if I know American politics and law, I know damn well that this is not just going to stop here. A pattern of modern day discriminatory legislature is that it targets where civil 
civil rights have already been limited due to extenuating circumstances, so aka minors or kids under the age of 18, or prison systems. It's a lot easier to get people on board in those specific contexts because there's either a resolve to protect or to not care. It may seem out of focus for the left to focus so heavily on this, but it really speaks to a grander issue. These bills and laws openly discriminate against a people group, something that multiple movements over multiple decades have effortfully fought against. It would make no sense for the online left to be made aware of this and not respond. This fundamentally goes against equity, against equality. The conversations around trans people in sports, more specifically trans women in sports, is very complex, but this bill and its distinguishers are incongruent with one of the pinnacle sports authorities in the entire world, the Olympics. And I'm referring to their now rescinded sex reassignment guidance of 2015. This very limited definition and scope of sex in this bill is vastly more conservative than that of what many sports experts say is acceptable. I want to be even more clear here. This is not about whether or not you agree with the Olympics specific 2015 policy either, but rather to illustrate that the Olympics provided an avenue for trans athletes to compete in congruence with their gender identity. Whereas House Bill 734 would ensure no opportunity for trans athletes to ever do so due to the descriptor of sex being so narrow with no consideration to even medical or physical transitions. No exceptions are outlined here. Hence, trans athletes under this bill would always be required to compete against their born sex no matter what stage of transitioning they are in. Should I look at this and turn my head away to focus on the economic discomfort of the white working class when I have now been presented with an example of a bill that threatens the civility of trans people and spits in the face of equality? Like I said before, this bill also outlines a push for a study that they've already decided what the results are going to be. It seeks to not observe and pinpoint potential drawbacks of intersex or trans girls and women's participating in female sports, but to look at the benefits to women and girls of participating in single sex sports that would be lost by allowing intersex trans girls or women to participate. This deterministic wording has already told us what the results are going to be. Normally, studies are led by a hypothesis, and then you seek to do everything in your power to disprove that hypothesis to ensure its accuracy. What this is doing is explicitly letting us know what the results will say, and implicitly telling us that they will do everything in their power to make sure the results are what they want them to be. I don't know about you guys, but I don't define a direct threat to one's pursuit of happiness as a micro issue. It's not just about sports, about bathrooms, about people liking or even accepting trans people even. It's about yet another group being made a target of the state. And because of people's fear, lack of exposure, and lack of understanding, it is now being made okay to question their very existence. And when that happens, when that dehumanization becomes so thorough, we wind up with Jim Crow-like laws, not to be dramatic. If we are okay to make blatant statements like, no child should be able to transition medically or surgically, due to the minuscule amounts of studies and reporting we have, why does it seem like such a big step to think that this will eventually lend itself as a president to something else. Why stop at those under the age of 18? Our brains don't fully develop until we're in our mid-20s. Why not make the argument that no one can transition until then? Oh wait, West Virginia has already covered that. This isn't about this being a slippery slope. It's about recognizing that when you attempt to give the state this kind of power to determine how people should live their lives, you willfully accept an existence of less freedom than what we already have. At some point, both Kidology and the online left are going to have to be okay with saying, I don't know, but I do know this. In their conversation about this issue, FD shouldn't have asked about Kidology's positioning if he wasn't prepared to give his, but I can understand why he wavered. Transitioning medically or surgically is already complex. And when you throw a child or a person under the age of 18 into the mix, it makes you want to approach it even more cautiously. I don't think the online left, unless they're actually trans, I've noticed, give enough charitability to some people's apprehension in that specific conversation. But one thing we should all be able to agree on is that there isn't enough research, enough data, enough longitudinal information regarding trans people and their experiences. And because of that, I don't see why we would advocate for causing even more limitations and hindrances. This will never 
be one size fits all. Transitioning seems deeply personal and significantly impacts not just the individual, but all of those around them who care about them. For that reason, the discussion on who should be allowed to transition and when, I think, should be left up to the individual and the professionals intimately intertwined with their decision-making process. It won't be perfect. There will be mistakes. There have been mistakes and those mistakes should be studied, but that's anything in life. That's everything in life. That's everything in psychology, in law, in the medical field. We don't stop exploring, stop growing, stop learning because of fear driven by propaganda, obvious propaganda, blatant propaganda. Trans people are just another convenient pawn being used by the right to confuse and fear monger in order to solicit a quick vote. But that's politics. If it's not Chinese immigrants, then it's black people. If it's not black people, then it's Arabs and Muslims. If it's not Arabs and Muslims, then it's Mexican immigrants and refugees. And it's always an other. Someone or something that distinctly looks or experiences life in a way that you do not. Hate and fear, after all, drives people so much more than peace and civility do. That's why there always needs to be an enemy in any political front. That enemy is ultimately what binds different political groups together. Not your causes, your ideologies, or whatever else. And when that enemy loses power or is played out, you start to find the enemy amongst yourselves. Kidology's train of thought regarding macro versus micro issues isn't tracking for me here. Because what is the implication? If a group is a minority, then politically, we should not extend care, resources, and support? If that's the case, why defend incels or trans-exclusionary radical feminists? These are also minority groups when discussing ideologues. And yet, a significant portion of Kidology's channel is dedicated to these groups. And while she is not politically involved herself, she does advocate for the left to consider these groups in their discussions. When analyzing Kidology's channel closely enough, I begun to pick up on a pattern. If a person, figure, or group is hard to engage with, hard to contend with, Kidology is there to pick up the pieces. She has run defense or alternative thoughts in reference to Jordan Peterson, JK Rowling, incels, edgelords, and so on and so forth. And personally, I take no issue with this because I think it is valuable and important to have someone who is not married to a political side to analyze these sorts of topics. It can be refreshing and can encourage people to get out of their own heads, whether they agree with the content or not. The concern I'm having is contending with the obvious linked enemy or opposition rather, to all of these topics. Leftists, or generalized leftist thoughts. <laughs> Persistent critiques of the left alone do not faze me. It is ludicrous for some leftists to lean into the idea that if one does not consistently critique both the left and the right, then that person is right-leaning. Rather than understanding that that person more than likely agrees with the left, at least fundamentally, and because that person gives a level of validity to the left that they do not reserve for the right, then that person would understandably be more likely to critique the left. So leftist slander on her channel amuses me. But what makes me wonder about Kidology's content is when there seems to be a pattern of core contradictions and these contradictions seem to only arise when speaking in relation to the left. For example, in this Bride 2 video, there's consistent references to herself being a capitalist or enjoying the notion of privilege, which the latter I believe to be some kind of cheeky dry humor, but probably still true to her in some way. And in my personal capitalistic opinion, I'm a capitalist, go and make your dough. Superficially, a capitalist is someone who positively accepts and participates in a capitalist system. A capitalist system is based on the principle of private ownership of the means of production. To capitalize under this system would mean to seize ownership of a good or some sort of commodity and within legal means, make it the most profitable for oneself as possible. For a video essayist, the commodity is both herself and her idea. Now, I do operate on the belief that everyone who builds a platform on social media is in some way, in practice, a capitalist. We capitalize on ourselves, our parasocial relationships, etc. I also do not believe capitalism in and of itself encourages any type of ethical or moral treatment of others, which is why it is often said and caveated under the purest on paper form of capitalism, the economy will just filter itself out based on the consumer's desires, which is a bold-faced lie. Because Kidology is willfully and gleefully a capitalist, 
I'm going to pose probably one of the most asinine questions in this entire video. Why is she upset that FD Signifier and friends reacted to her kindly do better piece? And this was all a result of the things that FD said in his response to my video and directly to me. The views on my original video suddenly stopped entirely and all the views went to his out of context reaction to particular statements I'd made. FD saw an opportunity in his words to address some of the very popular concerns within the online left, and he capitalized on it. It was not a malicious act to break down this video the way we did. It was because this video presents some very significant and important issues that we on the left do need to engage with, not because, see, I've started laughing. I'm not going to do that. Not because this was a um, challenging video argumentative wise, but because it illustrated the types of challenges that we need to get better at dealing with, with how far we are from just regular people. And the people who didn't like her content that was exposed to it by him, they did something about it, apparently. My channel was reported. I lost subscribers. I lost the majority of my income. That seems to be the filtering aspect of capitalism. If Kidology were the capitalist she totes herself as, this would not be a critique she would levy against FD, I should think. We don't get to run and hide our hands from our own spoken principles when it is simply not convenient for us. FD criticizing and capitalizing upon a smaller YouTube creator is the kind of behavior capitalism as an economic structure unequivocally promotes. <laughs> Which is why I would never refer to myself as a capitalist in ideology, though I am not a socialist or a communist either. I tend not to label myself by whatever economic structure I think might be the most feasible in the pursuit of equality, which is none. What I find most frustrating about Kidology is not her desire to be subversive or even provocative, but the inability to reflect on why people would derive from her content blatant, convenient contradictions and then, from there, create a narrative of disingenuity. I think that in some cases, in her pursuit to extract the nuance, we'll say, she leaves some of it behind. Circling back to her criticisms on the essentialism of blackness in the cornbread to realm, she stated the following. What I'm saying is that the attempt here was to, I think inadvertently, essentialize the Black experience as being that of traumatic and associated with intergenerational trauma. Inevitably, in this world, there are Black people who have not and are not experiencing this intergenerational trauma insofar as uh, the capital that is passed down from generation to generation. It's as if the middle the black middle class doesn't exist it's as if in the 1920s a flourishing black middle class did not exist i mean i think there is so much more nuance and it just essentializes this idea that that intergenerational trauma or inequalities are passed down. She speaks of the essentialism of Cornbread Tube in a way that it sounds like she believes they believe blackness is tied to disparity. The existence of wealthy black people in the 20s and earlier, like Mary Ellen Pleasant, Robert Reed Church, and of course, Madam C.J. Walker, did not negate their blackness or their experiences with racism. Pleasant was notably an abolitionist. Church was born a slave, one of the biracial children born of rape, unfortunately. He then went on to promote black liberation with his granddaughter later co-founding the NAACP. Hannah Ellis, one of the richest women in the 1900s, was dubbed the Negro Enchantress or the Ebony Enslaver in the tabloids at the time. Being black and wealthy does not save one from the black experience, which again is a very American term. These little spoken of historical figures seem to understand that, based what is known of their tribulations and later works. Why can't Kidology? I respect the assertion that American or Western race relations shouldn't be applied to countries that are primarily Black dominated. I think that to be obvious. <laughs> But I'm growing tired of the constant devaluement of these dynamics with regards 
to the West. It is a constant fallback that Kidology and many other African creators utilize even when contextually nobody was talking about them. I would assume that some of the points I levied against Kidology in this particular section would make some of you wonder why I don't think of her as transphobic or anti-black. But these two words have been stretched by the online left to encompass far more than what is largely understood. Transphobia no longer only describes abject disgust, disingenuous uncertainty, or fear mongering towards trans people and their existence. It can now be applied to someone not having flushed out or certain enough opinions on anything and everything relating in some way to trans identity. Anti-blackness can now be ascribed to someone who is insensitive or unthoughtful in their language or someone who does not care too deeply about being black aside from society's interactions with them because of that distinction. While I do believe people can be implicitly transphobic, implicitly anti-black, I believe the distinguisher for me when it comes to these terms and when to apply them online are intentionality and deliberateness. Deliberateness that is not driven by ignorance or a lack of experience, but deliberate in that the person fully understands the counter arguments as well as how their own arguments speak to and supports prejudicial actions. Kidology to me is someone who does truly try to understand people as people. Someone who is truly curious and analytical. We just disagree on topics. That doesn't make me stupid. It doesn't make her uninformed and it doesn't make either of us bigoted. It just means we disagree on approach, on evaluations, on appliance, and that's fine. Can you guys tell me something? Why don't you guys like infighting? <laughs> the left's rise to relevance online, it's still pretty new. You should fight. You should argue. You probably shouldn't agree in the weeds on everything. Because we often look at past left-leaning movements through a historical lens, I think we make the mistake of not acknowledging all of the schisms and particularities of them. Even with Huey P. Newton's push for a more Marxist perspective to be ingrained in the Black Panther's philosophy, there were still a number of detractors within the group who wanted to retain the Black nationalistic ideology. Feminism has obviously experienced numerous growing pains throughout time. Even more right-leaning political stances have grown in complexity and argumentation over the decades. Why would online leftist rhetoric be any different? There's often this mask of calling everything drama that I think is supposed to serve as a self-regulatory check to let your audience know that you know as a creator this shit isn't that serious. But I reside in the realm of thinking that even though something is not that serious doesn't mean there isn't any value value in it or a learning opportunity. I think Demon Mama's Drama Mama series is a very good example of this. The bait bros versus video essays discourse only lack the ability to add value because of the limitless character assassinations and laziness presented in all sides of the argumentation. Like I said previously, it takes actual time and effort to sit down and watch another creator's content in order to build an argument for or against them. It's a very intentional and purposeful practice practice, and in doing so, you may find yourself revising, editing, or reframing some of your arguments as you really get to know another's content outside of the sphere you reside in. I think that's something both Noah and FD both had to face head on in their discussions with Vosh and Shark, respectively. It's something that leftist streamers like Demon Mama seem to be very well aware of as well. I, I, I did my best, at least in this conversation, to try and drill down on that to the best of my ability is just like well I, I don't know how you can compare somebody who you agree with on 90 percent of things with by your own admission to somebody who you definitely candace owens is not there's no i i, I don't believe that there's a 90 percent agreement between soul bunny and candace owens which to me just further illustrates that that was a um a an out of pocket, uh, exaggeratory, hyperbolic comparison to make. A critique that I used to make towards the online left is that there's no cohesion in it. This would be a well-deserved critique within typical American politics when it comes to parties, but after thinking on it a bit more, I don't think it's very fair to the online left. The online sphere is so large and vast that it would be insane to think that there could be any type of true poignant political goals of the online left. You all operate as individuals, not as a group 
group or as a party. There is strength in this concept, decentralized politics that is. One creator who speaks in a certain way can pull in an outsider to the leftist political sphere whereas another could fail in doing so. Decentralization can make leftist membership per se very vast if you guys allow for it. You can see that in these creators' audiences. There's nothing innately wrong with being soft and sensitive, just like there's nothing inherently wrong with being loud and edgy. We could go down a rabbit hole about every bad or inaccurate or ignorant thing any creator said, of course. I don't think that this is some massive realization that no one has ever thought of. It's something that Shark mentioned in his conversation a year or so ago with FD Signifier before his big fallout with Cornbread 2. It was a sentiment repeated by both FD and Noah later on as well. So we, or you all, because I'm not actually a leftist, you all know this and seem to appreciate it. So why is there such a push for hegemony amongst the online left? Well, because despite what I just said, when politics are pulled from the online realm, out of textbooks and academia, and applied to reality, hegemony is actually needed. If you take a look at the present day political campaigns of Trump versus Biden, they're very short, very snappy, and isolated. For Biden, his entire campaign is basically anti-Trump. And Trump's continues to be free speech and running America like a business. In other words, they're operating within the very accepted political realm of today. This is actually reflected in Progressive Victory, a canvassing project Destiny, Keffels, and previously Vosh, I believe, were involved in to drum up votes for the Democrats. What would a leftist populist say? I will dismantle this oppressive establishment board by board. I mean, good luck. <laughs> I am, of course, kidding, slightly. The Party for Socialism and Liberation's 2016 presidential candidate was Gloria La Riva, whose platform centered around the slogan of, for the earth and humanity to live, capitalism must end, in racism, police brutality, and mass incarceration, fight for socialism. And to the general voter, this means absolutely nothing. <laughs> That said, the question becomes, what is the utility of the online left in life if the parties associated with it tend to not have political power because the messaging is too radical for the general public? What use is it to be an online leftist when, in life, the associated parties consistently fail in garnering support? Because leftists don't want to partner with Democrats, don't want to touch centrists, don't want to collaborate with liberals, what is the use of political idealism? The answer is nothing. There is true potential for the left to influence current structures with socialism by expanding welfare programs, for instance, by creating strong arguments for as to why government assistance evaluations should consider one's net income rather than their gross income. In that respect, leftists would be battling with bureaucracy. <laughs> These pursuits are often not acted upon or foolishly abandoned because it's not good enough. Slow growth be damned, I suppose. So what is good enough? Creating video essays centered upon why X, Y, or Z person isn't good enough to be a leftist? Moralizing people's unspoken political leanings? Arguing about whether a word is a slur or not? Abandoning your own spoken ethics for the sake of self-interest? To be clear, I have no problem with this type of content existing because it's entertainment. But when you actually take this as some type of true political statement, when FD, Bosch, ContraPoints, Noah, philosophy to become your political pundits, you're going to have to come back down to earth. I don't even believe most of you guys see these creators as political pundits. No, they're just talented, thoughtful, yet flawed individuals who you have developed deep parasocial relationships with, and that's all. I've said a lot in this video, but ultimately, my major point is, BreadTube may utilize popular politicized rhetoric, they may speak on topics that are politically adjacent, they may be from various politicized identities, but their content is just as apolitical as mine or Kidology's. And they are just as human as you or I. It's hard for the left to move forward in the United States. I've always recognized that these systems are not built in your favor, but I do implore you to keep going, to keep valuing education, detailed knowledge, and 
and different people's experiences. We can't all be nihilists. <laughs> this sick, sad world must have balance after all. At the end of her bread tube analysis, Kelogy stated that she was afraid of publishing the video out of fear of these creators. I can tell you I have been petrified to talk about, especially the section in this video that I actually do have a personal investment in, the section on cornbread tube, because I am fucking scared of those people and of their communities. Fortunately, I'm not. Over my short time on YouTube, I've released several videos of varying quality in hindsight that critique a handful of very popular leftist creators. And they've all been pretty reasonably receptive and considerably kind. I understand that that's not everyone's experience and it may not be mine this time. <laughs> But all I can do is be honest about where my thoughts are, where they have changed, and where I think we all can do a little bit better. Thanks for watching.